Richard Wendy will keep working throughout the duration of our sunrise safari. We are coming to you live from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Great Kruger National Park of South Africa. Not only are we live, but we can also send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv. Please do send us through your questions. We love to hear from you. And we're going to start off our morning with a herd of impala. Good morning, guys. We also have Rebecca and Lou in final control. Just to finish off our introductions before we talk about these lovely antelope. Impala, also known as rooibok in Afrikaans because of this lovely red color that they especially adopt when it is a cold, windy morning as it is this morning. And they've probably had a very scary evening last night. Dark, windy, predators roaming, no sense, and I mean that seriously. As soon as the wind hits, their sense of smell and hearing is immediately compromised. And it becomes very, very scary, and they become very, very skittish. We did actually start off this morning with a herd of elephants, but because it's windy, they also didn't seem to want to stick around, and they went dashing off into the bush. Good morning, Impala. Update on the various things and what you may have missed yesterday on the Sunset Safari. There was a massive herd of buffalo that went across to the Arethusa Dam. I couldn't find Shadow. I don't know where she went. She was seen with a kill on Arethusa, but she had been chased away by a hyena by the time that we got there. And because there were so many vehicle tracks and other tracks around, I couldn't quite figure out exactly where she went. Although I don't think she would have gone too far. Shadow is a female leopard, for those of you who are wondering about that. Karula has been doing her usual mysterious stunts and appears to be crossing backwards and forwards from Juma and south towards Hoffman's and Little Gauri. Uh, we will be keeping an eye out for her as well. Mvula was on Tambuti Dam Wall, which is to the north of our boundary yesterday, and he wandered south towards Juma at the end of the evening yesterday. And hopefully he's still around. Mvula is a big male leopard. The lions, having Steph and I, having spent sort of three days ch running away from Steph and myself, they are now on the boundary between Buffles Hook and Torchwood, just, just where we can't go and see them, um, so to the east of our boundary, on a buffalo kill. Though it seems as though potentially there's not that much meat left on the buffalo. I was very, very upset when they decided to catch something just, just, just that little bit too far away. But because there's two males and four females feeding off it, probably five at some point during the night, because that fifth lioness must have come through, and three very tiny little lion cubs, there's probably not much meat left. Hopefully they decide to come back to us. And that was a summary. Others say the flies recognize him as their true king. All we know is we call him Steph and he'd like to say good morning. <laughs> I must be honest, I don't quite know where Jamie gets all this uh, poetic license from this early in the morning uh, to escape my feet, my frontal lobe function. I'm Steph Winterboer and on camera today is Gerrit. And we've literally just stopped here on the road to what looked like a drag mark, to be honest with you. I don't quite know if it is or it isn't. I'm just busy deciding. I'll show you what exactly it was that caught my eye. If you have a look down this line, you'll see that just there in that two track, there basically, is a bunch of, is a swirl with a bit of vegetation that's been pushed up. A swirl and a push and that is so indicative of a drag mark. Now what a drag mark is, <clears throat> is um, when a leopard or a lion or a hyena even have, has killed something, quite often what they do is they drag the with piece of prey a bit of vegetation that's been pushed up 
and they stash it somewhere. They a either swirl cache and it a push, and that is so indicative of a drag mark. Um, now, what a drag mark is, tops of trees, <coughs> is um, simply when a leopard or a lion or a hyena young even lions will quite often pull a piece away. Quite often, away what they do and, uh, is they drag the piece of prey away from the scene of the crime, and they stash it somewhere. They either cache it in hyena cache it in water, um, leopard cache it in tops of trees. Lions just simply devour it, but. Young lions will quite often pull a piece away and uh, eat it in relative security or if, without the fear of the total carcass being stolen by a bigger lion. But I don't know if it is. I think that's actually just an elephant's trunk that has been swishing. Quite often they do exactly that. They relax their trunk, which then is about has about this much of their trunk length that can go onto the road and as they walk and swing their head the trunk makes this S serpentine motion and can sometimes push up the sand. Why I don't think it's a drag mark is that it doesn't carry on going from here onto the other side of the road and there's lots of elephant tracks around here as well. So no drag mark and this was exactly where Mvula was seen last night which is what immediately got my attention. But he was seen here, he was seen on top of this dam wall. I'm going to show you now. And here's a herd of impala, which could have been a potential victim. This is exactly what Khat wanted to see this morning, so I'm quite happy that I managed to show him what he wanted to see first. These male impala have been going through this very weird thing lately where they've been displaying rutting behavior. That's what you're looking at there is a bush. Let me see if I can take you back to the impala. <clears throat> so generally <clears throat> they chase one another around like this, snorting and blowing in these little bachelor herds during the rut which is when male impala compete with one another for the attentions of the ladies and for their harem. But right now, these groups of male impala have appeared all over the place and are displaying this rutting behavior. And it's, it's a, I don't know what it is. For me, it's an enigma. I'm not too sure why they're doing this. There is, a, there is some evidence to support a sort of mini rut that happens a few weeks after the main rut and that's what it could be. It's also what would explain the fact that after the impalas give mass birth around November, December time, that you always find these Christmas babies and January babies, these youngsters, not too many, but these youngsters coming through. And I don't know if it's a way for impala ewes that didn't fall pregnant during the first rut to have a chance at falling pregnant at the second mini rut. I've never read that anyway, it's just a hypothesis I have. But it doesn't look like any of these impala Ooh, Michael 18 has pitched me a question this morning. Good morning Michael, you've said that why are there no gazelle in Juma, and you've always used the term fawn rather than uh, lamb or calf. Now, to answer your first question, Michael, the 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 uh, the, the one on why there no um, gazelle in in Juma. Quite simply, gazelle is a collective name for a group of antelope sharing similar characteristics. The most of the buck sort of animals that you're seeing. Uh, here at Juma belong to the antelope family or the antelope group, not to the gazelle group. We do find gazelle in South Africa. They are springbuck, but the springbuck are almost entirely contained within the inland plateau and to the drier desert areas of this country. They are our only gazelle. And then further up in Africa, we do get the Thompson's gazelle. Oh, I've just disconnected myself here. I've just, and we do get the Thompson's gazelle as well, as well as one or two other types of gazelle-like antelope that occur 
but further north in Africa and definitely onto the inland plateau. All the antelope that we see here, all the buck-like an animals that you see, the even-toed ungulates here are part of the antelopines, the antelope group of, of animals. I hope that helped you out there. As to your second one, with regards to a fawn and a, and a, and a, and a, and a lamb, I'm not too sure actually, to be quite honest with you. I don't know where the differentiator would be. <coughs> it's possibly the difference between a gazelle baby and an antelope baby. One is a fawn and one is a lamb. I'm not too sure. We call them lambs out here. Impalas have lambs. Um, and then as soon as you get from nyala up, so anything bigger than a nyala becomes a calf. So you get a kudu calf and you get an eland calf and you get a buffalo calf. You don't get lambs from about Nyala upwards. I think it's just probably a language thing um, and an area thing rather than anything specific or scientific, if you ask me. But then if you do find anything that <coughs> can support or discredit that particular statement, you're welcome to send it through to uh, questions at wildearth.tv on emails or you could use the hashtag Safari Live and I'll gladly share what the real or what the actual definition of that is. I enjoy learning as much as anybody else and absolutely don't take offense at being corrected whilst on drive. I actually quite enjoy it. I'd rather be factual than maintain a swollen ego. In actual fact, in almost all cases, I'd prefer that. All right. My plan for this morning was to just double check here at Tambuti Pan and see if Mvula's tracks cross over. Herbert last night, he was last in the sighting and he said to me that we could absolutely expect Mvula's tracks to come across the boundary. He was looking with intent south towards Vuyatela Dam and towards Vuyatela. And if I were to paint a picture from what I believe is happening, I believe that Sindile made his way down the Mawati drainage line yesterday from midday all the way through to yesterday evening. And I believe that Mvula coming out of uh, Biffle's hook on one of his regular patrols picked up on that fact and maybe came down in the Mulwati, which is his stomping ground, and is trying to push Sindile out. Not too sure why I believe that. It just sounds like a plausible theory for what a full grown male leopard would do in an area that is his. And they tend to keep these young males pushed out to the outskirts of their territory. And then that young male will go into the next leopard's territory until he's found and then gets pushed out into the next leopard's territory. And it's, it's necessary. Young male leopards will be pushed from territory to territory for up to a couple of years by the dominant male leopard in any given area. And it's good that because it pushes them out of their natal ranges and stops inbreeding from happening. Except in this particular case, there's something else happening over here that even had the scientist uh, in charge of predator conservation of this area baffled. He says he cannot, he cannot explain how Sindile, who, this, this is his natal range, who having been freed in his natal range as an adolescent, basically, um, managed to do this massive loop, open gate, which is from here roughly 80 kilometers away, all the way to Skukuza, which is from here about a hundred kilometers away and then made this big loop back to join on Father's Day as you so luckily saw to join his mother back on Juma again and hasn't left since then. He's basically been hanging around this area sometimes going into the Manuleti, sometimes going out towards the Kruger boundary but mainly just hanging around in this area. Why isn't he leaving? He says he doesn't know. Part of that 80-20 theory that he pitched at me the other day. 80% of the times animals will behave like we've studied them to behave and like we know of the 80% of the time behaving like nothing you've ever seen before. What's going Oh, no, it seems as though Steph has relatively quickly disappeared off your screens, as you can imagine, or as you all know by now. Bringing you a live safari from the center of the African bushveld does result in 
the occasional minor signal dip. Now, having spoken a bit about the win windy, not windy, win windy weather, um, you know what, if you do several drives straight, you forget your mastery of the English language. Not that I ever claim to have had a mastery of the English language, but I'm certainly struggling now. On a windy day, everything wants to hide away. Go, they often go and they lie down. They're nervous, first of all, and then second of all, most of the animals are trying to reduce the amount of surface area that's being exposed to this cutting wind. So a lot of them are harder to find because they've ducked down. However, I have got an update which has changed my plans ever so slightly. I have been sucked into Karula's net. She crossed back into Juma with her cubs sometime last night. So we are going to go and just, just check out a few of her favorite areas before we make our way to Cheetah Plains. I also have to confess, I don't know that a trip to Cheetah Plains this morning is such a good idea with this weather. Because if it's windy like this where we are right now, those op that open area we could basically put the car in neutral and sail around the clearing. Which, whilst it would be thoroughly entertaining, probably not conducive to your safari experience. It actually almost feels like it's, in fact it really feels like it's going to rain. And hello to Porridge Silt. And absolutely not, you are not watching a caged safari. Trust me, you've only had to have seen the last few drives where we didn't find anything in order to believe us. Now, caged silt, if you want to, if you want to do a little bit of research, you can have a look at where Juma and Arethusa fall in the Sabi sand. Basically, we are connected. Actually, let's stop because if we look east, I mean, we're not quite high enough to see it. Yes, essentially there are fences here, as there are fences everywhere, but we are open to the Kruger National Park, which puts us, and that includes the surrounding areas, Manuleti, Timbavati, Klesiri, uh, Baluli, into Mozambique, into Zimbabwe, and then of course the greater Kruger National Park area itself that you are currently looking across the vast expanse of. All in all, it gives us a wilderness area that is larger than a lot of small countries, including the country of Wales. It equates to 8.5 million acres, or four, close to 4 million hectares, of unfenced wilderness area, depending upon where you happen to be from, porridge silt. So no, you're definitely not watching a caged safari, I can promise you that. The way that our animals evade us, if you need any proof, as I said, the last three days they've all been running away from us. There are no caged safaris here. Every single animal here is completely 100% wild. The only thing I can tell you though is that through years and years of very ethical guiding within the Sabi sand, the animals have become completely comfortable with the presence of the vehicles. Uh, it's an area that relies upon tourism in order to promote conservation. Uh, the money that tourists bring in, in order for money to come in from tourists, they need to be able to see animals and that is one of the focuses of the Sabi sand and it has been done to the point that the animals were kind of as much as a, of a part of their lives as a tree or a termite mound, not quite I'm not going to try and stretch things to say that we're basically a natural part of extension of the environment, we're not but the animals are relatively relaxed around the vehicles sometimes but every now and again we encounter an animal that has come in from a complete wilderness area. Some, the other day we saw some elephants from the Kruger National Park that I suspect it's been a long time since they've seen safari vehicles and might even have been the first time seeing our filming vehicle which looks completely different. Uh, we do this twice a day, every day, porridge silt and some of our regular viewers, a lot of our regular viewers have been watching for years and years and as a result have got to know all of our characters extremely well their tragedies and their joys and their triumphs and right now I'm looking for one such example which is a leopard with two five-month gorgeous gorgeous five-month-old cubs that we've basically all fallen in love with I hope you stay with us porridge salt and we can find you something oh if you ever needed an example that our animals are wild there goes a racing daker it was a grey daker. Oh, stopped. Got You've got his tail. Awesome. Well done, Dave. Here we go. 
a grey or a common dacre. As I said, windy days, and if you combine that with a dacre's naturally nervous nature, and off it goes. Very sweet little antelope. Tiny little creatures. Okay. What else can we found you, find you on this wonderfully non-caged safari? It's one of those days, one of those days that started off warm and is now freezing. Good point. <laughs> Good point from Justin S, an observation more than anything else. So I'm going to try and get you a view of these birds because we don't always get to look at them. We see their red billed and their yellow billed cousins more regularly. We don't often stop to look at the grey hornbill. Sorry, Justin, I'll get back to you in one moment. Oh, bye-bye. I will get back to you right now. Justin S., on the subject of our leopard characters, has observed or feels that the hyenas seem to harass Shadow or steal her kills more often than the other leopards, and why might that be? I think there's a couple of reasons behind that. One is Shadow is not very good at putting her kills in a tree, have the hyenas learnt that? I don't know. It's a stretch to say that they have, but hyenas are very, very intelligent. It's not impossible that they've learnt to dog her footsteps, so to speak. I don't know what the hyena-friendly term for that would be. I don't think so, though. I think it's more the fact that she just doesn't hoist. Therefore, the average marauding hyena sniffing around will have a chance to find her. Secondly, Apparently, I've never actually got the total numbers, but apparently the hyena clan of, in her territory, in fact, she's on the border between our clan's territory and a clan from Elephant Plains and Arethusa that is supposedly exceptionally large. And we've seen at least 15 of them feeding around that hippo, baby hippo carcass once, so we know that there are lots of them around, and I think that might be one reason as well. And perhaps some leopards just have more of a talent for avoiding hyena action than others. That being said, I don't think, I don't necessarily think she's been targeted that much more than the other leopards. And Karuda loses her kills to hyenas all the time. She's just slightly better at hoisting, whether it is because she's stronger or because she's got better instincts, I don't know. We, it's, a, it's a fact that we speculate alongside Shadow's skill as a mother which I always find a bit sad to talk about because I feel that she's just been incredibly unlucky. But there's no doubt that Karula has beaten the odds many, many times. She is an exception to a rule. And the extraordinary, and of course for new viewers such as Porridge Silt, Shadow is Karula's oldest daughter alongside her twin sister Tandi. All three of whom, Karula, Tandi and Shadow, have young cubs at the moment. We've yet to see Tundies, they're still very, very tiny. But we have seen Shadow's little girl and Karula, uh, Karula's little boy and girl. That I'm really, really hoping we can find for you today. Okay, now we've got to do a quick summary for Mota on the ages of our various cubs, and with pleasure, Mota, I will update you on the ages. Karula's cubs are nearly six months old. They must be, what, five and a half months old at this point. They were born on the 2nd of February. Um, Shadow's cub is around four months old. We don't know its exact date of birth, but it's probably around four or so months, maybe four and a half months old. It's been a while since we've seen the little thing as well. Um, the lion, oh, Tandy's cubs are a couple of weeks. I'm not sure exactly when they were born. I'd have to, my days tend to blur into one, but I would say that they were born sometime at the beginning of July. So they're only a couple of weeks old. Our lion cubs are the oldest set we think is close to, let's see, when we last saw them, we said must be close to about 10 or so weeks old. Coming up to three months now. They're definitely starting to look robust and strong, like little, um, I'm chain, I'm sorry, I'm being indecisive about where I want to go. We're going to go this way. 
Uh, uh, let's go backwards quickly. The youngest set of cubs is... When did we start seeing them? They must be close to three and a half weeks, maybe even four. Possibly a bit younger. Yeah, three and a half-ish weeks old. So they're very, very tiny. When we first saw them, their ears hadn't even popped up yet. They were probably about 10 days old. There might be a third set of Nkuhuma cubs, or there may not be. Certainly three lionesses had suckle marks. The third lioness has been mating with a Birmingham boy, and she seems to have been stuck mating with a Birmingham boy for the last few days. We haven't managed to find her. We don't know if she has cubs or if she doesn't. We have no idea at this stage. But we're not, we're not discounting the possibility just yet. But we don't know how old they are, obviously. Okay, so I think that, oh, no, no, Inkanyeni, who has, I think, still one remaining. Unfortunately, it looks as though she's only got one cub. She lost one of them. I don't know which one, and we don't know how. But her cubs must be, what are they now, seven, eight months old. Getting big. Not that I've ever managed to see them just yet, but they're around. They are around. Right now, of course, this is Steph's last. Steph doesn't often get to drive you guys around, and this is Steph's last date for now, because Brent will be back tomorrow. So, hence the bizarre introductions, just to explain a little bit behind the humour. However, they say his strength is derived from drinking a potion made from elephant dung water, which is an in joke, by the way, but only if you're watching the Father's Day specials. Others say the deep manly boom of his voice is able to communicate rumbles at a frequency that elephants can hear hundreds of kilometers away. All we know is we call him Steph. <laughs> I'm starting to get more and more worried about that one now, Jamie. I think that the sun has been beating down upon her brow for way too long. I have to stake her out and let her dry out a bit. <laughs> no, we've uh, checked the den site, the lion den site here at Bifflesuk Dam. No activity, not even a footprint. And I'm beginning to think that Gert's prediction about this lioness having moved her cubs potentially is not far from the truth. <clears throat> Lions will quite often move den sites frequently, in actual fact, when, um, when cubs are this young. And I think that this is... This is maybe one of those things. It could also possibly be just our timing. And it could also possibly be the fact that they have killed a buffalo quite close by and that the female may even have taken the cubs. I don't think she would have. Those cubs are still too young. No, she hasn't taken the cubs to feed there. But she may have just moved them. Or she came back in the night time, fed them a little bit, and now they're back, or she's back at least, at the carcass site but definitely no activity. What I am going to check though is Bifflesuk Dam. It is one of the closer water points to this particular kill and perhaps what we're lucky, if we're lucky, we'll find something drinking there. On a cold, windy day, overcast day like today, dams are not going to be very popular. Animals will use the colder temperatures to actually get into areas that they cannot normally get to because of fear of heat exhaustion. So I have no doubt that today we will see that these animals will be dispersed. Now Jamie McCartan, you've asked me if, uh, if animals hibernate for winter here. Jamie, it doesn't get that cold that animals need to build up reserves that will last them through a time when there's absolutely no food. In other words, when there's lots of snow cover on the ground that covers up vegetation or it just becomes so debilitating the cold that animals use more energy keeping warm than what they can ingest from the available food sources out in the, in the bush. Here, even though it does get very dry as you can see and food sources are very limited, they don't really hibernate. We do get some snakes and of course frogs and tortoises go into a dormancy period 
that is similar to hibernation. I would say that the closest tier that we get to hibernation is probably the tortoises, which go into a sort of slumber um, during the coldest months of the year here, when there's absolutely no wet vegetation for them to feed on. So I think that that's probably the closest, but definitely nothing like you find in the northern hemisphere where animals basically go and ensconce themselves in a cave or cavern and have their... Okay, so the lioness tracks go down the road here. So she did actually visit the den site last night and join this road going in this direction, which is good news. At least we know that she's still in this particular area. Where she went to after that, I'm not too sure. The tracks have been blown over by the wind that has been basically just buffeting these tracks since last night. In actual fact, oh no, the tracks are still on the road, on the left-hand side. Let's go down and check the water. We may, may just be lucky. If all of you in your minds start to project all your wishes at your screens right now, think lioness. Let's see if we're lucky enough to change or to, let's say, have some luck thrown our way. All right, while we approach Buffalzook Dam, Jamie's got some zebra and impala to show you. We do indeed. We have a lovely collection of zebra and impala to show you. All standing, staring off into the distance. You know that it's going to be an interesting drive when you show Rebecca some zebra and she goes, Hallelujah! <laughs> so we do indeed have a combination. Safety in numbers prevails once again. We have a social aggregation of impala and zebra. And in this case, a bachelor herd of impala, still a little bit jumpy around each other, along with what looks like a breeding herd of zebra. Now that is the stallion that is walking behind the rest of the group amongst the rams. You can tell by the thin strip of black between the cheeks of his bottom underneath his tail. And you could be forgiven for thinking that he looks too round to be a male, that perhaps he might be a pregnant female. That's because zebra are always round. They always look as though they are in good condition because their digestive process produces a large amount of gas which in turn swells their bellies up in a barrel-like fashion. The only way to tell that a zebra is starting to struggle in terms of nutrition is if their mane starts to flop to the side. That is the first indicator. Something we haven't seen yet, and I'm hoping that we don't get to see as we carry on into our dry season and into the drought. And giving us a lovely indication of how well stripes work in terms of sort of blurring one animal's outline into the others. So he's got his harem. It will be led by the female, the head female, she will walk in front into the wind. All of the animals at the moment will start feeding into the wind so that they can smell an advancing predator. So she will walk ahead, make sure that she's ready to smell anything that might come past, that might be in front of them. And the stallion protects the rear of the herd. Um, Dave, do you think we can look at those hardy dars? Sorry. A flock of hardy dars. And it becomes even funnier. I was always told when I was a kid that the reason they make that call is because they're really afraid of heights. Which <laughs> becomes really funny when you imagine them flying through the air going, ah! A hardy dar ibis. They're not, of course, afraid of heights. <laughs> well done, Dave. And off our hardy dars go. Back to our bachelor herd of impala. My suspicion is that the pregnancy hormones is what's causing the false rutting-like behavior. They're definitely too late to get lucky with any of the ladies. But because most of the females are pregnant, I think the initial pregnancy hormone, the spike of progesterone, um, 
other pregnancy hormones is causing a sort of a, a false estrus type impression amongst the males. Also, I think just the residual hike in testosterone on the male's part, they get a bit more jumpy around each other. They've just become so used to every time they walk past a male getting challenged that their that behavior sticks around for a little while. They're looking good, though. Still in very good condition. No boy. Now that's a gland, by the way, on the top of his head there, between his horns. There is a, a story amongst the sort of the guiding fraternity, one of those things that I feel might have been started as a partial joke or a partial misunderstanding of the facts. Oh, he's got an interesting ear as well. But the idea is that the impala time their mating and their breeding and their births by that gland on the top of their head that is geared towards registering daylight hours. So essentially in the shorter days of the year they start to mate in May and long as the days start to get longer towards the summer solstice they then give birth. I don't think so. I think that sounds a little bit of a stretch of the truth. There's probably definitely a hormonal function of that gland, that we can be sure. But whether or not it is measuring day length, I think, might be a bit of a stretch of one's imagination. But certainly it will play a role in their hormones. Or at least giving an indication of their hormones. So one of the reasons that impala thrash the trees when they are going through their rut, first of all, it's to look very, very intimidating, mm -hmm. often results in scratched eyes, but it also spreads their scent from that gland on, and the pre-orbital glands around their eyes onto the various branches. Impala are just full of mystery scent glands. They've got two on the back of their back legs as well. The metatarsal glands. Also, the purpose of which is a mystery in a way. There's lots of theories, but the truth is we don't totally know. And our lovely impala, always very svelte looking, although they are quite puffed up at the moment, but very svelte looking because they spend a large percent of their time grooming themselves and each other. Well, not right now. Right now they're sort of at a sort of slight war with each other. But they do aloe groom, and they've got special loose teeth in their bottom jaw for that exact purpose. Which is why they always look so incredibly tidy. Bit puffed up right now, though. Okay, let's carry on our search for the lovely Karula. Before I start up, Tony's looking at the clouds above our heads and was wondering whether I think we might get rain. Tony, as you know, my meteorological skill is quite fantastic. My predictions are always 100% wrong. It certainly feels like rain, let's put it that way. And it's meant, it's, there was some rain predicted, but I mean our, our weathermen are about as accurate as I am. It's, it's a, we're in a bit of competition there in terms of our accuracy. I think if it does rain, it's going to be two drops, maybe a light drizzle, enough to dampen us um, and for to sort of add to the chill factor, but not enough to really make any kind of difference to the water situation out here. Unfortunately, I'd love to tell you different. I'd love to tell you we're about to get a solid, nice drizzle for the next three days, but I don't think that that's going to happen, unfortunately. But as I said, I'm now 100. I'm always wrong, so. Who knows? Your guess is as good as mine. Apparently it rained in Nelspreit, which isn't too far away from us. You never know. Hopefully, it does decide to rain. That being said, the rain now will fill the dams, but it won't make a difference to the plant life, which is past its growth season. It needed the rain before, it will need the rain in the future. But right now, it's not going to make that much of a difference to most of, at least, the grass life out here. It's past its growing stage of the year. Okay, wait, hold on a second. I'm not ready to link it. I've forgotten what I was going to say about Steph. Oh, no. I'm running out of ideas. What were we going to say, Dave? Oh, yes. Some say that all he needs to start a fire is the click of his fingers and his very special cotton wool ball. Others say... 
Oh, I'm going to repeat one because you missed it the first time. Others say he was raised by a friendly family of battleers. All we know is that we call him Steph. I feel like I was raised by a friendly family of badgers, to be quite honest with you, if that's exactly what Jamie said. I got a bit garbled there halfway through. I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do with this one. I'd, I'd gladly take any suggestions that you have at the moment. I'm quite enjoying this drive today, to be quite honest. It seems that there's this... It feels like it's going to rain. It smells like it's going to rain. There's this, like, rainy smell in the air at the moment. But, um... But yeah, it might not. It's not uncommon to get rain in these months, to be quite honest with you, especially with the hardcore cold fronts that come up from the Western Cape and from Antarctica. And um, it does rain sometimes. They make for incredibly uncomfortable safari days when you have a freezing cold cold front come through with rain and you have to go out on safari and see nothing and get hypothermia. But that I don't think is going to happen today. Today's just one of those days that are just going to be overcast and a bit blustery. Which is fine. I like these days. So Chimera, you've asked if we get snow anywhere. And in all the years that I've been in the Sabi Sands, I haven't seen snow in the low felt. Here it stays a little bit too warm and it's a little bit too dry for snow to happen. But I can't remember what year it was. It was, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years ago. Um, there was snow on the Drakensberg that we could see from the Sabi Sand. So every now and again, those sunset shots where you have the Drakensberg in the distance there, the tallest peak is called Maripskop. On top of Maripskop one year, there was just this blanket of snow, it was absolutely beautiful and we could see it from here. We of course were still in shorts and only a thin jacket, although I must say that day it was, I got very close to unpacking my long pants from the plastic wrapper that they arrived in, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. <laughs> but, uh, so no, it doesn't snow here, Kamira, it's just a little bit too warm, a little bit too dry, and we're a little bit too close to the ocean for that to happen here, at this particular latitude. Um, but definitely on the higher peaks in the Drakensberg, which is a ridge of mountain that circles the inland plateau, pretty much continuous all the way from Lesotho, uh, a couple of hundred kilometers from here, all the way through to this part of the northern Drakensberg range here, and that does get snow from time to time in winter time. All right, now we're about to turn onto Cheetah Cut Line. And Cheetah Cut Line is important because it separates one drainage line system from another. It separates the Mowati drainage line. Actually, it doesn't. This is just two very big arms of the Mulwati drainage line. Because if I'm picturing in my mind the Mulwati, it actually becomes relatively big further down there and then joins a big river called the Nwati Tsonso River, some word that I absolutely love using from time to time. And that Nwati Tsonso River then flows into the Kruger National Park and flows past uh, a, 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 a picnic spot called Chokwan, which is in every South African's forefront of his mind. It's the first time you get out of your father or your mother's car on a Kruger trip and make a breakfast around an open fire in the middle of the park. These memories just sort of come back. And so quite a special place, to be quite honest with you. And this is the start of that particular river. This is its drainage basins where the rain that falls here flows down these rivulets and eventually goes past Chokwan and from Chokwan I think it breaks through the little Bombo mountain ranges and joins, I'm trying to think now which river it would join. It will either join the Sabi River or it will join the uh, Lataba River. I'm not too sure which one it joins actually. And that will be on the Mozambican side of, uh, of Africa, on the other side of the Lubombo mountain range. just been asked to explain that rattling 
as you can see, the road in the dry season here develops what we call ruts. And ruts is where you get this compression of sand and a dip and a trough. And you can see basically there, those are ruts, those little waves. And they set up a resonance in the car and that shakes our poor aerial mount to pieces. <laughs> that shaking that you're hearing is this resonance being produced and the aerial going dig, 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 like this against its bracket. Which, of course, when Brent drives this car, shakes that bracket to pieces. We've now replaced the poor thing probably six or seven times after Brent's enthusiastic use of the equipment, including his car here. <laughs> Right, I do need to keep my ear on the radio. Naomi in Pretoria today, Pretoria, South Africa. Good morning, Naomi. You've asked uh, that, you, or you've remarked that you said that uh, you've seen some trackers sitting on the front of the vehicle in the Sabi Sands, and isn't it dangerous? Um, Naomi. In all my years of, of having trackers on the front of the car, I can say, I can count on my one hand the amount of times where the tracker was, was, the, uh, was the focus point of an attack and a focus charge. It's generally a car and generally the occupants at the back of the car, as much as what tourists don't want to hear that, but generally someone waving crazily or standing up or pointing wildly at a leopard is the focus of a charge, um, more so than anything else. Um, and so, no, I don't think that it's particularly dangerous. There are some areas where trackers are the focus. Sabi Sands has had safaris going in them for, I don't know, 60 years odd, somewhere around there. And I think that animals are quite used to seeing that shape. Um, I've worked in places that are much wilder than this, and there definitely you don't want to leave anyone hanging out the front of the car. And we absolutely don't do that. We bring trackers into the car when we are in sightings in other places in Africa. And, yeah, you just absolutely don't want to do that, you know. You want to keep your options open. You don't want to go and set up an innocent just because you're sticking to tradition. All right. Combing these areas. What I'm hoping for here is the fact that some of those lions that were eating on that buffalo in Torchwood, have come back this side after having fed and have a full belly. But I'm seeing no evidence of any footprints. The freshest footprints of lion that I saw were the footprints for that female lion around that den site. Virginia, all the way from Kentucky. Um, good evening, Virginia. It's deep in the night there for you. Um, you've asked if the lions take kills back to their cubs in the den sites. Virginia, I've never seen a lioness take a kill to cubs. I've almost always seen them bring their cubs to kills. Um, and it's, I don't quite know why almost every other cat will bring kills to their cubs at the den site, including hyena with the exception of cheetah, they don't really do that. Um, but lions just seem to do it the other way around. They just seem to have another way of, of doing it, really. They um, quite often will come back to suckle the cubs and then walk all the way back to feed again themselves, leaving the cubs unattended. And then from about eight weeks, six to eight weeks, the cubs start, the mother will go and fetch the cubs at the den site, bring them through to the kills, and they'll sit there with the kills tasting meat for the first time, not really joining in the frenzy that is feeding around a carcass, but definitely tasting meat when they can, and then suckling right there from their moms, which is of course an energy saver for the moms. And then from there, basically, just trying to trail and keep up with the pride, the mother will stash them in hidey places, go and hunt, they kill something, she'll come back, fetch the cubs, and they'll play this sort of hop, hopscotch game until they fit enough to keep up with the pride on their nightly forays. It's 
scanning the bush today. It's on a grey day like this that all the colours in the bush for me come out. It's not this sort of washed out colours that the sun gives us. You can definitely see, even here where we are now, we're in a thicket where we've got quite a few different colours going. From this side over here, these bright greens of this weeping wattle and of the guaris, that deeper, darker shade of green there. And then as we pan off to the left, we'll see that the colours change on these combretums. And you'll see the oranges and the golds and even some reds in some cases of these trees coming out. Have a look at that. Very different. And then of course the greys of the leafless trees. There is a haunting beauty about a dry season thicket or forest like we're looking at now. Parkland like we're in it. But I must say, I do enjoy the vibrance of summer. I'm picturing in my mind that electric green swaying grasslands that we get here in January and February. And for some reason, I'm yearning for those. I like summer. Summer for me is the best time of the year, only because it... Excuse me, breaking off while I'm busy speaking to you there. I've got much safari voices happening in my ear from radio. <laughs> I'm still busy practicing how to talk and listen and think about two different things at the same time. Something that my colleagues are getting better and better at every day and I seem to be lagging behind on. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, summertime. So I enjoy summertime a lot because my interests lie in insects and in plants and flowers and in the smaller creepy crawly things around the bush. That's where my passion lies at the moment. It changes from year to year. Some year I enjoy butterflies, other years I enjoy spiders, some years I enjoy snakes, other years I enjoy grasses and that way it sort of spices up the year. So I don't quite know what's going to hold my interest in the year to come. We'll wait and see. I don't know yet either. These things sort of make themselves clear as the year progresses and whatever is the dominant life form at a particular time uh, grabs my interest really. I just have to listen to the radio a little bit. Excuse me, looking vacant, vacantly at my radio, hoping for an answer to come out of it. Now, Mike Steff, uh, sorry, I've just been presenting and hence my radio comms are a little bit intermittent. Uh, just confirm I'm still first time out. Copy that, thank you very much. Um, I'm probably with you in the next sort of four to five minutes or so. Now for those of you who, uh, who know how our radio procedures work, you'd know that I don't go onto the Game Drive radio very often while I'm, ve while I'm live. And that means that there's something lying in store for us in Frontier in about four to five minutes. So absolutely stay tuned in. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Let's see if you can guess what it is. And um, to be quite honest with you, I'm actually not quite sure what it is myself. I called myself into a sighting thinking it was one thing. It may very well be something completely different. coming to a split in the road up front. I'm going to be going left to see what's happening. Right, and I think while we sort out the administration that needs to happen around this particular surprise that I have in store for you, it would be a good idea to go through and spend some time with Jamie quickly as you will be back with me shortly. See you in a bit. I have to admit I'm having a good chuckle because I think Steph's surprise is going to be very much a surprise to him as well. 
I know what it is um, because I wasn't presenting at the time so I've, I've been listening I know what it is uh, but I'm not going to tell you either in the meantime Aubrey and I are hot on the heels of Karula and her cubs I say hot on the heels we're warm on the heels of Karula and her cubs or at least we sort of vaguely know where Karula and her cubs went which is this way towards twin dams and Aubrey's taking elephant skull which I just called elephant carcass on the game drive channel and he gave me that that you know that silence that disapproving silence on the other end of a, of a radio maybe you don't but I got the disapproving silence through the radio for a moment and he picked up and went okay I'll drive elephant skull then okay sorry Aubrey <laughs> I can't, I, for some reason, Elephant Skull and Carcass, that road name, confuses me. Anyway, moving on from my lack of ability to learn road names, we're coming through to a road I do know very well, which is called Twin Dams Road. Karula likes to stay in this portion of the reserve at the moment with her cubs. That seems to be her general pattern. And she's often left her cubs on the road called, I can't even remember which one it is now, it's Elephant Skull. She, that's where we had them playing for about two days recently on their own just entertaining themselves being thoroughly well behaved as only leopards cubs can be well behaved I'm going to guess that hmm <laughs> interesting I'm going to guess and say that this is where Karula crossed last night and the reason I say that is because there are a whole load of vehicle tracks here in the dirt I don't even see I don't see her tracks but I do see vehicle tracks and I wouldn't be surprised at all if this is where she went across and her vehicles were with her last night checking in the trees now oh, her little cubs from what Aubrey said it sounds as though her little cubs are becoming more and more independent he said that the one of the cubs actually crossed south without her disappeared off for a while before rejoining her and that is a natural part of it and it's pretty might find uh, with no guarantees you might find that that's the female cub because the females do start to show a great deal of independence at around this age she's Shungile is going to be the one that starts to practice hunting first they both will but she will be the may even be the one that masters at first because she's certainly got a level of grace to her the way that she comports herself that I think bodes well for Karula's cubs just check really carefully around here onto Twin Dams, which is doing a very good imitation of Lake Kariba. Oh, Christopher, your question perhaps well placed for me to ask the advice of many of our other viewers. However, Christopher wants to know how many leopards that we see are a direct descendant of, of Karula. Chris, Shadow, Tandy, her twin daughters, her oldest twin daughters. There's then, we haven't seen Shinvidzi, but we have seen Shimbambalana recently. That is her son. Uh, Mishu and Induna we haven't seen, so we won't count those. And then Quarantine and Kunuma, both her sons. And therefore, Shadow's Sindila is her grandson, just to carry on with the thing. As well as Shadow's new cub is her granddaughter. Am I missing the, the direct descendants? That pretty much sums it up. All of the leopards in the area will have some degree of genetic connection. Uh, they may well share fathers. In fact, the father of Karula's cubs may well be the same father as Shadow's current cub. Uh, leopards not bound by human rules in terms of social norms. There we go. I think that's, have I got everything? Have I missed one? No, I think that's in terms of di direct relations. That's that's it. I don't know that she has any sisters around here or any brothers that are in this area that we would see. But as I said, there will be a level of genetic connection amongst all of the, especially the female leopards, because of course female leopards they hang around in their mother's territory. Let's just go. I mean, it's ridiculous. There's no chance. But I always pass these jackalberry trees and think what a perfect leopard tree they would be. So we might as well go and have a look. Yeah. 
One day, it will be a leopard tree. <laughs> um, Rebecca doesn't share my optimism. <laughs> Rebecca says to me, when you pass the jackalberry tree and there's no leopard in it, <laughs> okie dokie, one more, one more jackalberry tree if that's okay, Rebecca, and there's not a leopard in that one. I might check this one though, that's alright. <laughs> Goes the go away bird with a derisive tone. They're not. Sorry, Rebecca, your faith was misplaced, as was mine. All right, I hope you are all gearing up for Steph's surprise because, wait for it, wait for it. Some say the day he was born, the arrow marked babblers and the go away birds were silent for a day out of respect. Others say that when he dreams, he dreams in the language of ants. All we know is we call him Steph, and he has a surprise for you. Poor Steph. <laughs> I really don't know what else to do except just shake my head in shame that I'm associated with peers who have obvious higher brain functions but cannot put them to use. Anyway, we have finally got the surprise for you. And let me tell you, after three days of looking at nothing but dust, sand and leaves, trying to convince you that we know what we're doing, we have finally found that mating pair and you are just about to witness something, let's see. <laughs> no, she's not interested. No, there's still, there we go. Obviously behind all the bushes for you. So you can see now, let's see what she does now, not a very frantic mating. She's rolling on her back there, that's a sure sign that it was a successful copulation. Busy yawning, one of the Birmingham boys and it looks like one of the Nkuhuma lioness. Isn't that wonderful to see, not the actual act but the fact that these two have come together again after all this months and months of strife. He's now just sort of asserting his, asserting his dominance, not over her, but literally just over the area. He'll take some time now to just looking for a place here through the bushes where going to give us a better view of one or the other. How's that hat? Yeah, that's a little bit better. So even though males are associated to prides and would seem dominant over those prides because they steal kills from the female, they're well known to the females, they don't look, they don't, females don't react aggressive, aggressively to what we call pride males. They definitely are not the same thing. They, they, they can hardly even be called a proper pride when you consider males and females together. Females tolerate the dominant males in an area around them because of the fact that they are the strongest males in the areas that they live in at that particular time and that gives their babies the best chance of survival. So the females are actually the custodians of the strength of a pride, of, this, of, of the genetic strength of lions in a, in a particular area and are actually the treasure troves. Male lions compete with one another over an area that has female lions in and the strongest males are the ones that make it to maturity and the strongest males are the ones that have mating rights with the females. It's not necessarily the same thing. In other words, being the custodians of lion strength as a whole and being the strongest male in an area is not necessarily, uh, they're not the same game plan, they're two different game plans. And what you're looking at him, he's 
in attendance with this female and you could see after he finished mating he first walked one way and yawned and stood up nice and straight and looked the other way and yawned and was bristling that's just him showing anyone or anything in the area how big and how dominant he actually is and her females can actually hold off ovulating for almost a hundred days where they will give any male in an area the opportunity to try and usurp the male that's in attendance with her and if she doesn't feel that this male is up to the task they will absolutely withhold ovulating until the last possible minute they can withhold it up to a hundred days then their bodies will have to ovulate and then whatever dominant male is in the area will have a chance of mating with those females and in lion poor areas in in areas where lions have been hunted or persecuted it's not uncommon for inbreeding to happen as a species the females will know that to keep lion numbers there to keep to keep the, the the species going in an area they will sometimes have to inbreed does happen often in actual fact leopard and lion populations and they're quite resilient to that except for the fact that after some time you will start getting problems with size health problems and in fringe areas, in areas where lions live in very diff under very difficult conditions, it's not uncommon to find lions with no manes, females with manes, much smaller cats, abnormally large cats, just bizarre throwings around of stuff. And it's all because of this mixings. Kruger National Park, we don't have that, luckily. All the, all the game reserves in, the, in, in South Africa are fenced off from local populations and so you don't have this intense competition between people and animals so you you have very healthy populations of both people and animals living literally right next door to one another I mean our local village here is no more than I would say three kilometers four kilometers from where our camp is and a completely different system to what we live in right here isn't that amazing though hey Aubrey, you've just asked me if this is the female with suckle marks, and you know, as she rolled over onto her back there, I tried to see if she had any prominent suckle marks. Um, I'm going to say that I didn't see anything prominent, and that's the second part of your question. What do they look like? Suckle marks look exactly um, like circles around the nipple where the hair has been flattened with the saliva of the saliva and the, the, the excess milk that cubs leave behind after they've been suckling on those nipples so quite often in the early stages it's just flattened hair and as soon as the, the the cubs have their teeth their little milk teeth and start to lick that area to um, force mom basically into feeding them those patches of skin become quite bare and can even start to bleed and look quite sore in this particular case I haven't seen this female yet although I must be honest I just had a very very brief uh, visual of that and I'm sure as we spend a little bit more time here we should see another mating occur we should see her roll onto her back again and it will give us another opportunity to have a look at that now mating occurs Mating occurs, um, can occur at any time during the year. Cubs are born at any time during the year. There seems to be a flush of cubs, though, towards the end of the year, sort of Christmas time. Um, although females will give birth at any time, and it's, it's literally dictated to by how the pride dynamics are rather than the seasons. Um, but there is a slight increase in cub births. Uh, in an area in summertime, I think it sort of coincides with the abundance of game that give birth at the same time. A lot of babies around, moms have got a lot of food, and so it's easier just to have more cubs survive, more cubs get born during that time. Now, um, this mating will last for about five days. I think this is probably about day three or four. We'll see what the frequency of mating is. As it reaches its height, a male lion will mate with a female probably every three to five minutes for about 24 hours or so. 
and then it'll start to taper off again to a, about once the hairy goes again. So this is probably now every well, five to ten minutes or so. So I'd say this is where is she going? She grabbed her tail in his mouth to stop her. Oh, she's trotting away. She actually does look like she's got suckle marks, I'll be honest with you. She absolutely looks like she's got suckle marks, so... He's covering her again. Also just behind a bush, of course. Successful copulation, there she's rolling over. Now, quite often males become relatively pes pesky during matings. They don't want to leave females alone. And a female that has got babies, potentially even from another male lion, will quite often elicit sort of mating behavior. Their bodies are giving off pheromones their bodies are giving off pheromones very similar to, to, or hormones I should say, rather than pheromones. Very similar to those given off when she's not pregnant. And quite often females that are just pregnant, even by another male from a different pride, will mate with that pride male so that he thinks that the babies that are born are his and not a different males from a different pride. Of course if he figured that out, he'd kill those babies and that'll bring this female into estrus again and then he'd be able to mate with her and get his own progeny into the gene pool. So yeah, a mystery at the moment. And Hollow25 has just asked if she still does have cubs, hasn't he kept her away from those cubs for far too long? And would they have died? Uh, hollow, potentially. Um, it depends on how old those cubs are. Lions do do cooperative nursing. In other words, a different, ma a different female will be able to suckle another female's cubs. They definitely do do that. And... Um, but that'll all depend on how old those cubs are. If she's just had babies and has lost them, it could either be as a result of predation. Don't forget that cub mortality is incredibly high. 80% of all the cubs born in a given year die before they are one years old. And the primary cause of that death is predation from other predators. So hyena, leopard, other lion, um, yeah, basically just almost anything. Cubs are highly, highly vulnerable. And literally the chance of a cub making it to adolescence and then into adulthood is actually quite slim, to be honest with you. So there's a good chance that maybe she's lost her cubs. Females can so James Richards has just asked if uh, this female is having a postpartum sort of estrus cycle and wants to know how long that'll last. Will it be similar to a, a you know a normal estrus uh, uh, cycle? To be honest with you, James, I don't know. Um, I haven't observed lions as closely as that for as long. Um, generally speaking, I would say that in my experience, yes, it's about as long. Maybe shortened probably by two days, maybe three days maximum out of a five to seven day cycle. So it could be shorter significantly. Is it something that I've noticed? Is it something that I've picked up on? Um, no, I haven't seen that many. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I've seen male and female lions mating, I don't know. Let me think back here now. Over the years, probably 20 times. 
25 times, it's definitely not enough for me to judge exactly how long that is. And since I'm not a scientist and don't study these things and read scientific papers endlessly, to answer a question like this would be quite difficult for me with any sort of uh, reasonable fact in it. I can only really just talk to you from my observations. So, good question there, James. Nice one. All right, let's go back to these lines and have a look at what they're doing. The female now is quite relaxed. The male is also just in attendance. They become quite painful, I must be honest with you. You can see she'll try and get away for as long as she can, but until her body stops giving off the pheromones that is eliciting this behavior from this male, he will not leave her alone. Anthony, you've just asked me, or Anthony Law, you've just asked me, why do they always change location when they're mating like that? Anthony, it's literally just the female trying to give any other males in the area the chance to cover her as well. So although there is only one male here, it's an instinctual behavior to let her just get a bit of space in case there was another male that could possibly usurp this particular male. And it's why she leads this little chase he then is forced to dominate and cover her, and that in, in turn basically elicits that releasing of the egg function in her body. So she needs to be dominated before her body will release uh, the eggs to be fertilized. And there are some facts floating around that lions literally need to mate a thousand times for every one cub that gets born. As you can imagine, that's a lot of mating for every baby that makes it to one year of age. Just gives you an idea of how difficult it is actually for lions to maintain healthy pride numbers and to keep lions in any particular area there. They're quite often one of the first animals to disappear in an area. And in actual fact, lion numbers have decreased so dramatically over the last 20 years that almost entirely lions are now ensconced within national parks that do not occur in wild populations outside of national parks with the exception I believe of Namibia. Namibia is or has the last wild lion populations outside of natural or natural reserves or wildlife preserves and that is a great sadness in this world of ours. I do not believe that we will ever get to a point in our lifetimes or our kids' lifetimes again where we see free roaming wild lions outside of national parks. And even my child and perhaps even his child in the future will battle to see lions. In the Kruger National Park, roughly three and a half million hectare, there are, the later census suggests that there are less than a thousand lions. So less than one thousand of these great cats left. In the Kruger National Park, as to a total world population of these cats, I'm not actually sure. I think it's around about I think in Africa, probably around about 25,000, maybe. I don't know. That's a, that's a guess on my part. If any of you out there would like to just quickly research how many lions are thought to exist in the world, please feel free to send through the answer to that question to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live. I'll share it with everybody watching. But in the Kruger National Park last year, they reckon... Less than a thousand lions. It'll be interesting to see what the rest, what the other statistic is. And so this mating that we're seeing right now is very important. Whether it's postpartum mating or whether it's in actual fact a normal estrogen cycle where she's having her eggs fertilized, whatever it is, it's healthy, it's good, it's good to see.
So as we're watching now, her body will be picking up again. So as, as he dominated her, she would have released some chemicals, would have been released in her body. And that would have driven away the urge to mate. What we saw was there was about a 10 minute or so gap between one mating to the other. So I suggest it's probably going to be around about the same. And right now her body's building up, building up those chemical messages in her brain. And she's starting to feel an irresistible urge building, which the male will then respond to. That urge will become less and less frequent. And by the time they stop mating, it'll be about once every half an hour to once every 40 minutes or so. I think while we're waiting for that urge to manifest itself, it'll be a good time to send you over to Jamie for an update. I'll call you back as soon as any action happens. Um, I'm afraid to say, unlike Steph, I don't have any surprises up my sleeve. Just two rather nervous-looking impala, not that anybody could blame them. I think with the leopard lurking around last night, you cannot blame them for being on edge, especially with this wind. What are you looking at? What is there that has attracted your attention? She's interesting Karula is somewhere here she's in this very very dense block that she loves so much probably with a kill stashed under a tree or possibly in one and her two little cubs are feeding upon it uh, it's very difficult at the moment I can't even find where Aubrey says her tracks crossed the road and I've lost Aubrey completely but the two of us are continuing on our search what's there guys they don't look startled, but they're both staring in the same direction. Oh, no, they've decided to relax a little bit. Perhaps sizing each other up as well. Now, if an impala does see something like a lion or a leopard, they start a frantic barking alarm call sound. Back to Steph. Lions are doing something. She's not moving her tail to the side and making it very easy for him at all. That was actually unsuccessful. No, it was successful. <laughs> Obviously just didn't look close enough. There she rolls over. Have a look at that belly of hers. Let's have a decent look there now. So I'm seeing old suckle marks. I'm not seeing you. She looks like she has lost her cubs. Those suckle marks are definitely not recent. I mean, it would be explained by the fact that she hasn't been close to her cubs for a couple of days now. And the, it's been very dry. So who knows exactly what's going on over here. We'll definitely know within the next couple of weeks for sure. But right now, you can definitely see that those suckle marks are not in use. He is beautiful though. Alright, and with that, with that over and done with for now, I think we're going to send you back to Jamie. Sorry for stealing you away. That's quite all right. No problems there in having stolen us away. Oh, I found what the Impala were looking at with deep consternation. It was a very scary looking small Nyala with its tiny, tiny, tiny little horns just starting to come through. It hasn't even begun to acquire the long dark coat of an adult male. It's got a slightly fluffy feel to it. and off it disappears
a very nervous looking Nyala as well. As I said, this wind is definitely making them feel a bit uncomfortable. Uh, speaking of Nyala, James Black was wondering whether or not we eat any of the antelope in the same way that in America they eat venison or deer. And the answer is yes, people here do eat the antelope species in a sustainable way, in fact probably more sustainable and environmentally friendly than the sort of traditional farming practices of meat and other things. No, they, they do not here though. So all of the animals that you're seeing in this area are 100% safe from being killed and eaten. But it does happen uh, a lot. What is a slight problem, not here, because it is very, very well patrolled and secure, but in certain reserves, the one thing that they have a problem with is bushmeat poachers that set up a snare in and around the fence lines that they can then catch the, the animals that come through. Now, before we judge them too harshly, because it does result in some tragic situations, often catching unintended targets like leopards or lions or even wild dogs. But before we judge them too harshly, bear in mind that South Africa is a, is a country with some very serious socio-economic problems. And a lot of people are absolutely desperate and destitute. And as a result, they do try and catch the antelope that are outside or that are inside of protected areas. So it does happen. There are also legal stocks of antelope meat that you can buy pretty much at any butcher throughout the country. We do, South Africans do eat the venison of the antelope species, but as I said, not in this area. These animals are 100% protected and if you were to be found catching one and eating one, you would be guilty of poaching. And the same applies actually to fishing in these reserves as well. But there is most definitely, oh, it's a water buck. Oh, of course, I couldn't possibly go drive without seeing a water buck. It's been far too long. A water buck bull staring off into the distance, really well hidden. As I said, most of the animals are doing a fantastic job of hiding themselves away. In this case, behind a combination of tamburti quarry bushes and lead and knobthorn trees. A magnificent waterbuck bull, the symbol of the Sabi sand. And just since we are on the subject of, or while we're on the topic of the conversation of poaching, and while we look at our magnificent bull, Daryl, we've actually been, the Sabi sand is fortunate in that it has the finances and the abilities to put forward a huge effort in terms of anti-poaching. Rhino poaching is a problem throughout South Africa, an enormous problem, um, and the Sabi sand is not immune. However, things have taken a very positive turn over the last few months. We don't show rhino for the very specific reason, first of all, it's taking a stance against rhino poaching. It's also the company's policy that we don't want to make it any easier for poachers to find them. The truth is most of the rhino poaching comes from inside information anyway. However, the, the and I can't go into detail, obviously, about the anti-poaching steps, but suffice to say there are enormous anti-poaching measures in place, and we have some very brave people who stay behind the scenes to thank for the safety of the animals here. Pangolin is another animal that gets poached. Again, not so much in the Sabi sand, but bear in mind that we are open to the Kruger National Park, which in turn is open to places, desperate countries such as Mozambique and Zimbabwe, and that a great deal of the poaching profits go to those countries. The army is involved in protecting the Kruger National Park, it is sad. I know that it's something that Steph was discussing. It's not the Kruger National Park that I used to know. In terms of driving along the Lataba River or wherever you happen to be and all of a sudden you see po anti-poaching units moving through an area. And almost all of us, you'll find, have been involved in, as, as guides, almost all of us have been involved in some anti-poaching measure or another. 
something that I spent, not that I'm in any way qualified or trained as an anti-poacher, but um, something we've spent a great deal of time doing, or I spent a great deal of time doing. Go ahead, Aubrey. Copy, thanks, Orbs. Uh, where is your last track? Okay, copy. Thanks, Aubrey. I'll double check this area still. We shall not be conquered. We shall keep trying. Aubrey's going to go and show his guests the lions for now, and then he says he's going to come back and help me. It is difficult weather. It's also difficult weather to walk in, in the dense vegetation. And Elaine Cole, apparently where you are, they have reintroduced turkey, bear and elk. And he wants to know whether they have done similar things in this area. Absolutely they have. Now the Sabi sand has been established for many, many years, many decades. However, at a time it was actually farmland. So all of the animals had to, or quite a few of the animals had to be reintroduced. But even more so, we've got this expanding private sector of slightly smaller reserves where animals are being introduced constantly into areas where they have since been overproduced. Sorry, over to Steph and the lions. The mating. She sets herself up there. There we go. A successful copulation. It's not the most comfortable thing for either party. And apparently some of the literature that I've read says that the barb that he has on his penis is actually quite painful for both him and the female to withdraw. And you can see those suckle marks again. Let's see, he's probably going to lie in our way. Yeah. <laughs> Might just be able to get one. No. Not much else going on with this pair. It's So Aubrey's just asked what would happen if this lioness tried to escape or run away. Quite simply, Aubrey, the male would just follow. He would, uh, he would literally just hound her every step of the way until her body stops giving off the pheromones that is telling him to be in attendance. And that should happen in the next day or so. This is about day five of this particular mating that we know of, at least. And it's now every 10 minutes or so, 10 minutes, 12 minutes. I haven't quite been keeping a stopwatch on it, but about 10 or 12 minutes between mating sessions, which is still relatively frequent. Not as frequent as the every three to five minutes that it would have been at some point during this cycle, but definitely at 10 minutes still deep in it. Might go on for another 48 hours or so, like it is at the moment, and then what will gradually happen is these bouts between matings will go will be longer and longer and longer eventually going to a point where when she gets up and moves away he won't follow her and it's because she would have stopped giving her body would have stopped producing the chemicals that's telling him to respond in this particular manner so in the small answer to your question it's not easy for her to get away now whatsoever i think she's stuck with him until her body changes one of those things almost betrayed by her own body in this particular sense I must say it's not that warm right now. I think it's probably around between 60 and 70 degrees. So probably closer to 60 degrees. Uh, 
and you can see them curling up. Jamie McCartney has just asked a question about how long lions stay pregnant for. Jamie, they stay pregnant for about 110 days. So 110 days is the length of time that they stay pregnant for. They can go as short as 90 days, but generally they will go for over 100 days. 110 days. The babies are blind and helpless for the first couple of days of their life and then their eyes will open they are dependent on milk for the first eight weeks of their life uh, then they will be introduced to some meat after around about eight weeks they will then become fully weaned between six and nine months old and they will be independent and a productive member of the pride from about one and a half years for females to about two years for males after which the males literally leave they will then come into their sexual maturity, the males, and the females will, the, 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 the new young females at about two years will start to have their own litters and to start adding to the numbers of the pride. Males will then roam um, for the next couple of years to, the, to when they are about five years of age, at which point they will be big enough to take over their own prides, becoming into their prime from about six to seven years old, and then from seven years old onwards, they sort of decline um, in condition to a point where they're usurped by younger, stronger males. And finding lions that are older than 10 years old is relatively rare. It's not uncommon. It's relatively rare. In captivity, they can live up to about 16 years. Out here, it's very rare to find a lion older than 12 years. Females will have their first litter around about 18 months to 24 months. Somewhere around there, they'll have their first uh, litter. They will then become very dominant in the pride from five years of age to about nine years of age and after nine years of age they literally just add the experience and will taper off to about 12 years as well out here. The deaths of lions happen through a variety of things either an injury a massive injury sustained while hunting a horn through the gut being bashed by a buffalo so blunt force trauma or something like that that debilitates them and stops them from moving around or they get attacked by other lions very common cause of death amongst lions is being attacked by other lions or a lioness will find herself away from a pride and will be set upon by a hyena and a hyena will also sometimes kill lions like that so there is lion lifespan for you i think in a bit of a nutshell But what we're looking at here is a very, very, we're looking at a very, very special thing here. This is the generation of new life and has far-reaching consequences for lion numbers in the park going forward. A very important event you're witnessing here. Now Rob has asked, do lions, will this male and female hunt cooperative, cooperatively together? Uh, Rob let me think about that question because yes in a sense it's possible for them to hunt cooperatively while they are mating with one another do they do it though is the question um no they don't i have seen leopard while mating hunt cooperatively and share a kill while mating i've seen it once in my guiding career i have very rarely seen lions do anything except mate um, during their time together i'm trying to think back now as I'm sitting here right now, Rob, I can't think of a single occasion where I've witnessed male and female lions hunting, killing something and eating as well as mating. Um, even if they've stolen something, I'm thinking back in my memory banks now. I want to say I've maybe seen a lioness with a stolen kill feeding while mating once, but I can't actually remember the exact sighting. So no, let me just stick with that. Not common at all. She's just sleeping now. And Jamie McCartney has just asked me how many cubs can a lioness have at one time. Jamie, anywhere from one to six 
but it's common to have somewhere between two and four cubs at any one time. So one to six is what has been observed, but more commonly anywhere between two and four lions at any given time are what we commonly see out here. And they will stay together plus minus for the rest of their lives, those cubs that are born. Not only cubs that are born to the female will have a bond, a very tight bond, but also cubs born to other females at around the same time, within six months, will also have an incredibly tight bond with one another. The, uh, the litter mates will quite often stick together in very close groups for the rest of their lives. Males will move off together as a coalition. And females will very often stick together. Related females will hunt together, have cubs together, be found in each other's company most of the time throughout their lives. Very, very close. Ah, and the inevitable question from Anthony Law. What would happen if another male had to walk in here? Would they fight? Would he be ignored? What would happen? Anthony, if one of this, this, is, this Birmingham male, as we call him, is part of a coalition of four related males, and if one of those four or one of those three had to come up upon him, he'd probably try and maintain dominance over this female they will not fight for dominance over this female within this four in the coalition first come first served the male who gets to this female first and is in attendance first will have mating rights they will not battle with one another often it's not like it cannot happen this is just 80 percent of the time remember um, most commonly they will not battle for for dominance over a female the first one to get there is the one that will stay with that female if another male from a rival pride had to come here though, there will be a fight. There will be a big fight. And generally speaking, males will try and keep in their core territories, in the middle of their territories when they're mating, keep the females in the middle of their territories when they're mating to try and stop that from happening. On the fringes of this territory, you're going to have other males that could possibly come in. And if he was caught unawares, on to, uh, uh, mating with this female by another coalition that far outnumber him or outweigh him, he will absolutely be killed forthwith. He won't be able to leave this female. It's not in their making to want to leave a female that he's, that he's mating with. And unless he's driven off, uh, he will stand his ground and possibly even be killed. So unrelated males from different prides will fight. Males from the same coalition in that pride will generally not fight, just to answer your question as succinctly as I can. Ah, Daryl wants to know if these mating lines are close to their pride. Daryl, yes, actually, I don't know where the rest of the pride is. I do know, however, that they've just finished the buffalo they killed yesterday morning. Um, and that is probably less than a mile from here, from where we're sitting at the moment, is where the pride was. There's a very good chance that they are in the vicinity. She may even have been trying to get to that kill to feed a little bit, but was unable to do so because of this male keeping her so close under his watch. Um, but yes, they're relatively close. It's not necessarily always the case. Um, you do sometimes find that m mating pairs are very far away from where the rest of the pride is, but generally always in the core territory, in the middle of their core territory, where other male lions from other coalitions are not welcome. So in this particular case, yes, not always the case though. They're lying just in the open, in the wind, no real attempt made to try and shelter next to a bush or next to a thicket or, you know, dig a scrape in the sand to get to warmer sand. 
I think their body mass is big enough. She's roughly, she's not the biggest lioness I've ever seen, but she's probably around about 100 kilograms, 200 pounds. He's also not the biggest lion I've ever seen, but he's definitely around the 180 to 200 kilogram mark, potentially a little bit over that. So 400 pounds, just a little bit over 400 pounds. And I think probably at the bulk that they're at, big enough that cold snaps that we're having at the moment are not too much of a hindrance to them. That fur that they've got looks like the hair on top of my head, very sparse and thin. But let me tell you that that fur is probably half an inch thick and as dense as the densest hairbrush you've ever seen. The, the, the fibers of hair are very, very close to one another. And probably half an inch long. Rachel, you just asked me if, if a lioness only has one cub, uh, you believe or have heard that the lioness will abandon that cub. Rachel, I've never seen that happen myself. I've never read of that particular occurrence. So in my experience, I'd say that that's probably a bit of folklore. Um, it's not to say that somebody did not witness that particular event at some place, but I would say that it, if it did happen, it was abnormal and definitely not, not normal, not normal to happen. Uh, to give some scale to these lions, to give some scale to these lions and how big they actually are, the root of her tail there you will not be able to encompass with your one hand. Give you an idea of how thick that tail is. So do yourself a favor and put your two hands together, joining your fingertips to fingertips, making a circle between your forefingers and your thumb. That is the diameter of a male lion's tail. So let me show you here quickly. That is about the thickness of the root of a male lion's tail. I know it looks massive, but I tell you that that is as big as what it is. Maybe even a little bit bigger for a really big male. A female's root of her tail will probably be like this. So the diameter of a can, a soft drink can, that's the diameter of her tail. Male's paws. If I stretch my hand as white as what I can, his front paw will be bigger by about 10% on either side. With his forearms, where most of his power gets to, probably about as big as your upper arm is. Maybe even as big as your calf is. A, a, a chunk of meat and bone and sinew and tendon about this big. So they really are massive animals. He's just reacted to something here. Not too sure what it is. We are alone in this particular sighting now, so I think I'm going to quickly just change position of the car. Let's get ourselves into a slightly better position for in case they mate, or when they mate again, not in case they mate again. going to just stick with us while I quickly reposition the car. It shouldn't take us too long or be too painful. This will give us a much better view. Of this pair. I'm also just quickly going to take some time just to do some admin on the radio. I've been a very naughty boy in being in charge of this particular sighting. I haven't kept anyone updated. Our stations, um, a single, the, the mating pair is still static in the same place off of Cheetah Plains, just on the northern side of the junction of Central. There's only one mobile in this particular lock. Anyone wishing to join, please feel free to do so. If you cannot get me on the radio, it's just because I'm presenting at the same time. Feel free just to pull in. Right, that's administration out of the way. <laughs> she 
she's still busy sleeping. You can see the difference between the heads of the lions, the male lion and the female. Oh, here we go. She seems like they're hearing things. Oh, here we go. He won't be able to resist this. And of course, because I've moved, they're going to go exactly where... <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, yes. Go for it a little bit, just so we can get it when it does happen. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but... You can see he's absolutely not leaving her alone for a second. Not the nicest view, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> about the only view we could get and a big baleful stare in our direction afterwards for for doing that I'm sorry boy I didn't mean to to do that that was rude <laughs> bristling mane making himself look as big as possible And that very characteristic rolling over onto her back. And that's just to make sure that there's maximum fluid retention. You can imagine that if a thousand copulations for every baby that needs to reach a year old, that this female definitely wouldn't want to waste any effort any more effort I should say <laughs> in trying to fall pregnant The frequency to me has probably increased by maybe a minute or two, but that doesn't really matter too much. I think you need to take an average over a 24-hour 20, period. And I think we are in the waning period of this particular copulation, or not copulation, of this particular episode. Um, and I think we can, we're going to start seeing a definite in, well, uh, decrease in the frequency um, of copulations over the next sort of 24 hours or so. It'll be interesting to see how far they move. Yesterday morning we tracked them from very close to the camp, um, basically from from there to here um, was where they were found and I think it was because this female was probably trying to get to her sisters at that buffalo carcass but he managed to head her off before they got there. From there to here probably around three kilometers easily three and a half kilometers so yesterday they moved quite a distance today between last night and today they haven't even moved half a mile but anyway are we waiting for the next 10 minutes to bypass i think it'll be a good time for you to go and join jamie who as far as i heard is in a traffic jam whatever that means <laughs> i hope it's something good I think it's something good. I think it's something hilarious. We do find ourselves stuck in the road, actually. While Steph waits for the 10 minutes to bypass, we actually can't bypass this particular obstacle. This is a monkey thorn tree, and it has been very carefully placed right across the road. Right, so we, we attempted, Dave and myself, to, to move the tree, and we thought that perhaps, well, actually, let's rephrase that. The girls in Final Control are always watching what we're doing, and they thought it might be a nice idea to show you how that worked out for us. So why don't you have a look at this clip? <laughs> Apparently I'm scratching my head. This beanie's quite itchy. I'm now thinking to myself, how are we going to do this? But Dave has gallantly leapt into the fray to try and assist us. Now we're trying to work out where to move it and how to move it. Working out that one branch is stuck. Now I'm saying to, 
Now I'm saying to Dave, watch out for the thorns, Dave. At this point, one has attached himself to poor Dave's inner thigh. <laughs> As we pull frantically, <laughs> Dave is... And at this point, we decided... This, yep, no, we haven't changed a thing. Our brave Dave faced down those thorns, and the thorns emerged victorious, having taken a, <laughs> to quote Dave, a chunk out of his inner thigh. How are you feeling, Dave? I'm all right. You're all right. It's stinging gently. A bit, yes. Stinging a little bit, yes. Monkey, monkey thorns tend to do that. When I said look out for the thorns, I meant look out for the thorns. <laughs> So poor Dave, our wounded warrior, is um, back on camera once again. Both of us have decided that perhaps this tree can wait for another day. I'm going to turn around and go and look for those elephants that I can hear somewhere off in the distance. It's trumpeting furiously at something. And I'll, I think that perhaps David's wound is a bit too far up for propriety's sake. Um, I'm not sure how Dave feels about it, but I think perhaps... The wound will have to be remain between Dave, myself, and the monkey thorn. Unfortunately, let's suffice to say there is some blood. Gallons and gallons of blood. Not quite. There's a couple of drops of blood. <laughs> but he's a brave soldier and it could have been far worse than it was. Let's put it that way. Could have been far, far worse for Dave. I don't even think I would have laughed if that had been the case. I would have felt most tragically sorry for him. It's raining! Is it raining? Yeah. No, it is raining. It's drizzling. So as it gently drizzles down upon our heads and upon Dave's wounded, sweat-drenched brow, <laughs> uh, we were actually talking about reintroduction of animals into areas. And the amazing thing is, of course, as is typical of the human fashion, as South Africa was slowly became more and more civilized, in inverted commas, the natural progression is the animals' homes became more and more restricted as farmland became more popular or more necessary, particularly with the invention of DDTs, at which point this area and the areas around it became habitable. There's no longer the risk of sleeping sickness or malaria to take on. You still run the slight risk of malaria in this place, but it's not nearly what it used to be. Leidenburg, of course, the place of tears. A city not too far away from here, Leidenburg, called Leidenburg, because people lost half, or some, one, of the, one of the groups of settlers lost half their population to malaria. Anyway, so moving on from that, now what we've got is this constant expansion of private conservation in South Africa, which is a wonderful thing. It, people have realized that there is a sustainability to it, and so reintroduction of animals is occurring. And I got very lucky one evening watching certain animals being reintroduced for, to an area. I'm not going to say where and I'm not going to say what they were, but for the first time probably in about 70 years that these particular animals had roamed this patch of land. I watched them groggily standing up. They'd been moved from the Eastern Cape to the Low Felt um, and then watching them gently trot off into the night and then of course they realized that we one of them realized we were there and came gently not so gently trotting back towards us in a fury at the state it found itself in at which point we left the scene most hastily however up until that moment where i had to accelerate very rapidly it was a truly touching moment to see animals being reintroduced back into a place where they once existed quite peacefully all on their own now, the smaller the piece of land is, the more you have to manage it. We're fortunate where we are in that the land manages itself, the animal population manages itself. But there's a lot of fantastic work being done throughout South Africa. And of course with it always comes the increased risk of human, or at least... I'm talking, Franklin. Are you going to respond in kind? Can I carry on my conversation? Yes, thank you. Crested Franklin, telling everyone that it is alive and well this morning. 
And yes, with, it, with introduction of animals or reintroduction of animals comes the increased pressure on surrounding settlements and villages, but there are ways around that that have been wonderful to see. So, the rest of your brethren are calling, Franklin. You're going to join them. Oh, <laughs> Sister Killer gave the Franklin a fright. All right. I was hoping our Franklin might give us a demonstration of its call. I have decided to expand my search slightly farther afield for Karula. As you know, Karula occasionally sort of somehow jumps over. Watch out, monkey thorn, Dave. Yeah, watch out. Guard your, guard your inner thighs carefully. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? I've completely. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was. That is what I was going to say, Rebecca. You are right, but I didn't say guard. I said guard your inner thighs. Um, anyway, moving on. I was talking about Karula and the search for her. She's somewhere in that block. I've tried. It's very windy. It's very risky to walk in the dense areas where I think that she is hiding. So what we're going to do is we're going to just double check that she hasn't in fact skipped across the road, dodged leaving tracks completely, which occasionally Karula does. And as I said, we'll go just quickly have a look for those elephants that I heard trumpeting somewhere in this direction. I see my beanie's doing its usual thing. Just by the way, the beanie is, um, well, I washed it and the pom-pom now looks really sad and pathetic, <laughs> really sad and pathetic to the point that I'm contemplating cutting the pom-pom off, which is utterly devastating um, and this isn't my hat, so we'll have to wait for Kirsty's return to Wild Earth before I can get her permission in order to do that, since it is her beanie and not mine. I'm not looking forward to the moment when I show her the devastating effect that water has had upon that pom-pom. I'm unsure how to resurrect it. Okay, the eddies are somewhere here. Their fresh tracks are everywhere. It is windy, so we shall be approaching them with a degree of caution. Not that we don't always. I heard them here. And actually, it's quite a nice idea to just drive through the Mulwati as well. And absolutely, just talking about our leopard and our leopard cub was one of the things that we always enjoy watching is the bumbling first attempts of a leopard cub to hunt something. And yes, that Franklin would be a perfect prey for a young leopard cub. We once watched for ages, we watched an approach of Franklin's when, it, when Sindile was still very young before the, the dog incident. He, um, he was stalking a Franklin or at least a Franklin was unwittingly wandering towards him and he'd gone completely flat and still. He never pounced on it in the end, but there was a very good chance that he was going to. Where are these Illies? I wonder if they didn't trumpet because they heard they found Karula. It's possible. They've gone quiet again. And their tracks are sort of coming down in here. Ah oh, well, we're in the Mulwati now, we might as well explore it properly. One of my favorite things to do is to drive along this drainage system and just see whatever it is that can be seen. It is a perfect hiding hole for any of the leopards out here. And there's also always the chance of seeing the relatively rare bushbuck or anything of that nature. Lots of elephant tracks in this direction. In comes the slight patches of drizzle and some really beautiful trees in here as well. Some old jackalberries, some of Dave's favorite monkey thorns. <laughs> there we're gonna let him live that down. Um, Tambuertis. By the way, Dave, thank you so much for your um, gallant attempts at helping me out there. We did try. We tried. We put in all our effort, blood, sweat and tears. No tears. Dave didn't cry. Maybe just a little bit. 
just a little bit. And there's also, this is one of Karula's favorite hunting grounds. So I'm hoping we've missed her tracks coming across somewhere here and that she's in the drainage system. Imagine we see the cubs playing in the sand. Oh, it'd be wonderful. And welcome to Malik, who has, I think, is one of our newer viewers and said that you see that we have lions, leopards, and cheetah, but where on earth are those tigers hiding? Malik, we don't have any tigers in this area. The tigers are based in Asia, around India and Russia and those sorts of places. Unfortunately, ours is not the suitable place for a tiger. We do, there are tigers in South Africa. They are, however, not free roaming. They're not wild tigers. Unfortunately, as much as I would love and trust me, I would really, truly love to work with... Oh, goodness gracious. Not again. This is getting ridiculous. Okay, well, flat tire, here we go. This is a leadwood. Oh. Here we go. Over we go. Malik, I would love to work with tigers. It is a dream of mine one day to just even get to see a tiger in the wild. Unfortunately, there aren't any wondering about South Africa. Everybody ready to go through the archway? You ready, Dave? Here we go. Everybody duck. I love this archway. And now we are through and out the other side of the archway, desperately seeking anything to show you. Wait, I'm running out of ideas here. Hold on. Hold on a moment. I can't remember what my original one was. Ah, I remember now. Some say he can track a bird flying through the air. Others say he survived an entire year on a diet of just spike thorn leaves. Asterix disclaimer, please don't try that, you will die. All we know is that he is stiff, and I think he may still be with those lions. I'm not even going to try and come back with anything like that. I don't know what to say, well, except thank you, Jamie. I think, let, let me just start with that. Let's pay a compliment. Thank you very much for all those nice, kind words that you're saying about me. <laughs> Literally, since you've left us to right now, these lions have done exactly what you're seeing them doing at the moment just sleeping and resting up not using a lot of energy I think when you're not when you don't eat for five days or a week or whatever it is you don't want to do too much between bouts of of mating and basically but we're not getting too far away from when I think she's gonna jump up again we're about 10 minutes now so in another minute or two there we go there's her head up <laughs> the prediction. <laughs> Let's see what she does. Yeah, there we go. That was good timing on your part. Well done. There's a dominance again. Now we're going to be stuck. I'm going to have to try and find a gap for you here. There you go. Again, not the very best view for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Once again, balefully looking at us, boy, I promise you, that's all yours. <laughs> He's not in bad condition, actually. You can see how staunch his hindquarters are. He has got that belly flap of skin, though. You see, perhaps if he turns around one last time, you'll see a belly flap of skin. There you go. That's looking a little bit empty. That belly flap there is to allow for some expansion to happen when they bolt food down. 
eating almost David, who's a new viewer, welcome to the show, David. You, um, you've you asked, do lions need to eat while they're mating? Probably not, David, to be quite honest with you, unless they went into the mating sequence hungry. Um, both of these lions now have been going at it for about five days now, and the male hasn't lost too much condition. You can see, by virtue of that belly flap that was running down the middle of his belly, that he could do with a meal, he could do with something, but he's by no means skinny whatsoever. The female is also looking a bit lean, but once again, I would hazard to say that she's not doing too badly, actually. She's, uh, she's looking a bit lean, and I suppose in the next 48 hours or so, she's going to need to join her sisters and hopefully get a morsel to eat from them. But actually, they're not too bad. As to whether or not they will eat while they're mating, I think if food was readily available, in other words, if for instance, a leopard had to kill something or another lion had to kill something within earshot. The chance of them getting up and to go and steal it is a possibility. I would say that they'd probably go and do that um, and devour it. But it's unlikely that something like that will happen in this particular area. While not impossible, improbable. So they generally don't eat, even though they probably could do with a morsel or two. All right. And there is a little bit of speculation as to what lion this is. Has it been mating with this particular female? He does not have a split in his lip, which the other male did. The other male that we saw mating with a female lion a couple of days ago has a split in his lip. I, I presume it's the same female. I wasn't in that sighting. I'm not too sure exactly what it was. I did see a picture of that male though with that split in his lip and I can tell you that this male does not have a split in his lip. As to why he would be mating with this female and not the male with a split in his lip, that's one of these 20% questions again, these anomalies. Generally speaking, male lions from the same coalition do not swap partners once mating has commenced. Um, it may be that her body is going through a little bit of hormonal fluctuations and she wasn't giving off any particular pheromones for that portion of the day that one male arrived and another one left. I'm not too sure. That is one of these unanswerable questions right now without a detailed scientific investigation, something which I, possibly, well, I definitely won't be able to do, that's for sure. So as to yeah, why the males changed, I'm not too sure. You can see there she's... Oh no, I think she's just trying to get comfortable really. I don't think there's any sort of motion to movement going on here whatsoever. Now that they're lying about 50 yards away from us, have a look at the fantastic camouflage that her back is providing us against the backdrop of the, of the bush. There we can pull out, and although he's very distinctive, she, although has a smooth margin with her belly, and that's how we sometimes find them, is broken up by that bush there and is very camouflaged. Now imagine a dark night, or imagine yourself being a zebra, and on a dark night with that sort of coloration and this lioness sneaking up to you, I definitely don't want to be a zebra or an impala or anything that lion eats really. It would be one scary thing having the sand at your feet all of a sudden turn into a pair of teeth and claws.
So Michael18 has come up with the answer to a question that I pitched at our audience in the beginning of the show, where there was some debate as to what constituted a fawn and what constituted a lamb. And Michael18, thank you very much for helping us out with this, Michael. And so a you, or a lamb is the offspring of a you and a ram, and a fawn is the offspring of a buck and a doe. So it's just a language thing, really. Probably got to do with where it came from. But thank you very, very much, Michael. That's quite interesting. That that's uh, yeah, much appreciated. I love. Daryl has asked if male lions would help to take care of cubs. Uh, Daryl, in their own way, they, they, they do. The security of a particular pride is enhanced by males. And so males keeping out rival males mean that cubs won't get killed by those rival males in an effort to bring females into Easter so that their babies carry their genes. Um, so males really do, they, they don't have an, an, an active part, in other words they won't take over sort of parenting duties for an evening while mom goes out to hunt some zebra, that doesn't happen. But in their own way and in their own form they, they are essential to cub survival. They also will lend a hand at kills, especially larger kills, if males are with a pride and they happen to hunt some buffalo or even a giraffe or even some elephant in some cases, male lion, their weight in the fight is absolutely crucial to sometimes bringing down that kill. And in that case, meat is provided then for the whole pride, not just to be stolen or, or dominated by the males. And in that sense, they look after the baby's nutritional requirements, but that would only be on a sort of on-off basis, really. The biggest, definitely the biggest contribution that they do to looking after the cubs is to make sure that the cubs live in a relatively unmolested environment where it's just their moms and their siblings and all they need to do is basically hunt for food and look after themselves, take care around hyena and such. I hope that answered your question there. His mane is beautiful. He hasn't got a dark mane, a black mane. Not all male lions get black manes. They will get darker when they take over a pride. They also, their bodies also produce more testosterone around when they are, when they are in their prime, so between five and nine. But also taking over a pride changes the chemistry in their body as well, and they will get darker manes once they've taken over a pride. But you can see that the darker hair there on, his, on the back of his head starting to come through his long mane. Some lions, like those Matimba males, the one male, the hairy-bellied male of the Matimbas, which is the coalition of males that these Birmingham boys or this male helped to kick out a year ago, he had an enormous mane that extended all the way down basically to where his belly started and down his legs onto his elbows. He had a glorious mane. These youngsters, they don't yet have that. I have no doubt that one or two of them will get bigger manes, but it looks like he is a blonde male, this, rather than a dark, shaggy-haired male. And Justin S. has asked if a lioness will feel a loss um, if she loses her cubs and mourn them I suppose. Justin S, I have seen lionesses definitely show, um, I won't go so far as to say it's a sad emotion, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to say that lions have the types of emotions that we think about in terms of human emotions, but you definitely do see a sense of loss. They go through a mourning phase, they will call repeatedly, going from bush to bush to bush looking for, for, for their cubs. In some cases, if they find a body of a cub, they'll pick up the cub and walk around with it 
hopefully, I don't know what they're trying to do. In some cases, they even eat their dead cub. Um, why they do that, I'm not too sure. It's not just about, you know, wasting a potential food source. It's, it's, it's something deeper than that. I don't know what emotion that would be, but it's definitely something. Um, so absolutely, I, I think that they do mourn the loss of a cub. However, I don't think it's to the same degree that we do. And it may be, but maybe not for as long as what, um, as, as long as what we mourn the loss of our babies for. Don't forget that we've got slightly different structures to um, how, we, um, how we look after babies or how we, we, we deal with our own young. We place a massive amount of energy into the upbringing of our babies. Um, we are, are, are we're pregnant for nine months versus a lion's three months. We have these massive long periods of time, I think one of the longest in the animal kingdom, um, where babies are dependent on adults. And so we put a lot of energy into each individual baby. And we, we generally speaking, have relatively few children over our lifetimes compared to lions, which, are, which will have litters of up to six individuals every two years. They will have six and they'll do that for 12 years. Um, so I think it's different for these types of animals. I sells one baby at a time, lots of energy over a long period of time, to animals like lions, which have lots of babies at a time and, um, and don't put a lot of energy, relatively speaking, into the upbringing of their cubs. Uh, it's not to say that mothers do not give a lot of care and attention to their cubs. You absolutely see that they do. But it's just not over the same time period as what um, it is for us or other animals with, with um, these long, basically long toddler years. Elephant would be one, rhinoceros would be another, um, whales would be another one, porpoises like dolphins would be another one. I'm trying to think of other ones which have these massively long. Hyena would be another one. That, hyenas probably doesn't fall within this particular explanation as they also have litters that are quite large and they'll also put a lot of energy over a long period of time into bringing up their, their cubs. So yeah, interesting debate there or interesting question there. Let's see if anything else that I can add to that. No. So definitely they do feel, they don't feel for as long and I don't know to what degree. That's tough to, to gauge or tough to judge from where I sit here. <laughs> we have a new viewer watching us at the moment. His Twitter handle, I'm judging, is Silverback. Silverback, your, your, the name you've chosen to, to name yourself is, is generating many pictures in my head. Um, primary of which is, of course, the gorillas that Brent has just been to see in Rwanda. You are also a new viewer, and for that, I would like to say welcome onto the show. And I hope that we get to see or hear from you more often. And you've asked, am I not scared? Why am I not scared being so close to lions or the wild animals that we have out here? Um, to be honest with you, um, it's a bit of complacency, I would say. It's not to say that I'm not nervous of these animals. It's not to say that I don't get scared watching them sometimes or walking around in the bush or living here. It's just that this has been my home for the last 17 or 18 years. Um, and I've been watching and interacting with animals like this, not these particular ones, but animals like this for that entire time. And if I think back to my first couple of years of guiding, I was almost perpetually terrified of everything. I always thought every elephant was going to squash my car and every lion was going to jump into the back. But you get a sense of complacency, I suppose, with a bit of understanding and experience. Um, and that not every animal wants to jump into us. They don't see this particular vehicle as a source of food. We do not look like a zebra. We do not look like a, uh, an impala. We don't behave like prey species of animals. Uh, we don't smell or even in some cases taste like prey species of animals. Um, and that makes us just really part of the family once they relax and let you into the pride, so to say, or into the herd in terms of other animals. Um, it's not to say that dangerous encounters do not happen. They happen here very frequently, especially run-ins with elephants, tight situations with leopard. You can get yourself into sticky situations with lion from time to time. 
uh, more so on foot than in vehicles like this. But the time between being terrified and being awed and being feeling at peace in nature, I think, extends with this experience, knowledge, and this complacency syndrome that develops. Um, it's not to say it's not dangerous, though. If we had to act in, an, in a manner that is untoward, for instance, if those lions were mating right next to the car, which happens from time to time, and I had to all of a sudden make a sudden movement that seemed quite threatening, similar to that, those lions, there's every possibility that they could react negatively and jump against the car, even into it. There's no barrier here. There's nothing that I could do to stop that from happening. Has it happened before? Um, I've, I've watched a lion jump onto the back of a car, a game vehicle, before, um, and the game ranger just literally reversed his car over that lion and it ran away. I've also watched leopard jump onto car doors to inspect, um, to inspect people and to inspect the drivers of these particular cars. I've watched lion come right up to cars and sniff people and shoes and jackets. So, yes, I've seen close interactions like this before, but definitely not aggressive in the car uh, things. That's unheard of in the Sabi Sands. All right, well, that's a scary topic. Um, I think it's time to go back to Jamie for an update. To be 100% honest with you, lions coming towards cars would be, well, let's say that the morning that Dave and myself are having, it might be a welcome sight. <laughs> At some point, our bad luck streak has got to run out. But for now, I have absolutely no updates for you. The elephants seem to have crossed south out of our traverse area, or at least some of them did. There's got to be some remaining. But I can't find any. In the far distance, there is a bird of prey. <laughs> you see it there, Dave? Yeah. Let's have a look at that. And hopefully something will decide to come and find us. Looks like our hawk eagle. Hello, gorgeous. Oh, you're looking a bit ruffled on a windy day. And I think it's safe to say that's why our Franklins are chirping away frantically where, where they are in the drainage line. I, that's actually what brought me to this area was I was following the sound of them alarm calling. And I think that this chap, or dog lady, I'm not sure which one it is, may well be responsible for their consternation. An expert bird hunter in terms of catching guinea fowl in Franklin, there's usually two of them. In fact, I can almost guarantee there'll be a second somewhere there. I just can't, perhaps we can't see it from the angle that we're at. And I think judging by the Franklin's constant squawking in distress, that they perhaps made a failed attempt at catching one of them. And that happened to us the other day at the lion sighting, where we were sitting comfortably just watching the little lion cubs moving about and all of a sudden a frantic Franklin made a beeline for the safety of the termite mound only to discover that there was a lioness on the other side of it so the poor hapless Franklin was squawking managed to find itself safety but I think probably came away from that particular incident with a serious shot of adrenaline coursing through its system and once Franklin when Franklin are hunted by something like this if they have a happy escape they constantly make burp, 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 noises of distress. Sorry guys, there's a lot of communication happening on the game drive comms. Now, speaking of all of our birds, of course we shall be eagerly anticipating the return of some of the migratory species over the next few months. It's a little bit early to be expecting them to be returning, but it does give us an opportunity to answer Megan's question, which is of the birds we see, approximately what percentage will migrate during the winter months? Give me a second, Megan. I'm doing a rough calculation in my head to try and work that out. I would say probably around 15 to 20 percent. But all of most of the cuckoo species, a lot of the raptor species, and then quite a few are all well, the kingfishers, and the woodlands kingfisher, of course, being the one that we hear we hear its return broadcast very loudly the minute they get back with that chur call that they make. 
15 mm, percent I would say maybe 20 percent was a bit of a, a high estimate I'd have to I might actually ask Steph that question as well what he thinks the rough percentage is but that seems to me about right and we can see about over 300 different bird species while you are on these live safaris most of them however in the Sabi sand actually or quite a few of them spend a lot of time around the river system so things like the purple crested taraco, which I would love to be able to show you to add to your bird list, your budding bird list, we would have to travel elsewhere in order to find. And all the time, silently and quietly, we've actually been closely watched by a pair of browsing kudu that I have. Oh, there's the. Sorry, I think I see. I think I see the second one. Oh no, that's a. Looks like a battalier. The way that it's flying. Juvenile battalier. You see how the tail is slightly longer than an adult battalier, and then, of course, the lack of the striking colours. Well done, Dave. Awesome. You can see it rocking backwards and forwards in, this, in the high winds. I often wonder whether they enjoy flying in this sort of weather or whether it's actually kind of terrifying for them. So not the second of the hawk-eagle pair, but in fact a young battalier that has not yet acquired his adult plumage like our fish eagle that we saw yesterday. Just on the subject of our fish eagle, yes, hello, Kudu, I'll, I'll, we'll have a chat about them in a moment, but just on the subject of our fish eagle, the end of that saga yesterday when she caught the catfish, and I said I thought that she had dropped it, or he had dropped it, but that they'd, she'd called in a juvenile that flew in. She hadn't dropped it. She'd put, rested it on a leadwood. She'd been looking for a solid perch to put the catfish down, and then she gave up her spot and let the juvenile come in and feed. Just a fascinating end to that tale. And yes, there's the kudu that has been watching us the entire time while we've been sitting watching the hawk eagle. No, oh, she's playing camera shy with her attendant oxpecker, picking off the ticks from her fur. Let us continue on along Gari Cutline in the hope that we can find you something. Perhaps Mvula will pop out here, since he was just a little bit further to the north. We live in hope. I can't help but wonder where Karula's been hiding this whole time. Even the birds are actually playing a little bit hard to get this morning. Hiding away. It's the kind of miserable weather that most of the animals don't particularly enjoy. Except those really noisy Franklin that are still calling behind me. Come on, Gary Cutline, you haven't let me down for a long time. It's almost like my lucky road. Less so for poor Connor, for this is where he launches the drone from. That we've been practicing with, or experimenting with. Dave, I've just thought of something else. Yeah. You must be even more glad I told you to wear long pants today. Oh, yes. <laughs> that just occurred to me. Dave came out really optimistically in shorts this morning. Oh, I did warn him that the weather was going to be foul, but probably the long trousers also protected him from more serious thorn-inflicted injuries. Eddies have been through here as well, but they look like they're going north towards our northern boundary. And just an update, sorry, on why there's so much chatter on the Game Drive channel. They found a deceased elephant on Buffel's Hook. Now, it, it happens. It, it'll be natural causes from what they can see. Sometimes elephants do die. It's probably old age. It's probably not at this point any kind of drought-affected death. But there is a very large, apparently very large, dead elephant in Buffel's Hook. And I think there's a very good chance that our lions are going to start heading across in that direction when they smell it. It's just, just to the north of us, where unfortunately we cannot travel. We're limited in terms of where we can go. Good. 
Good morning, Aubrey. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Aubrey says that she hears me talking, or he hears me talking on the radio to Aubrey and was wondering if there is somebody called Aubrey working for Safari Live. There is indeed somebody called Aubrey who works on this reserve. He is a wonderful guide that guides out of Galago or Voyatella camps, mainly Galago. Now those are two lodges that guests can come and visit right next door to our Safari Live. So yes, Aubrey doesn't work for Safari Live or with our team, but we, well, we do work with him because he helps us find all of the animals. Now yes, Aubrey who has been around for many, many years in the bush and knows it like the back of his hand, which is one of the reasons why I've moved my search further afield for Karula, because if Aubrey thought we had a chance of finding her, he would still be there searching. Oh goody, there's another water buck watching our advance. So yes, Aubrey, there is another one of your, well, there's another Aubrey that works on Juma. Water buck bull observing us with a great deal of concentration and when they stand tall and proud like this you can see why they were chosen as the symbol of the sabi sand those beautiful outwardly curving horns deeply ridged by keratin growth thoroughly elegant antelope also particularly pungent antelope, but we won't hold that against them. James smell describes the smell as goat-like. And Veritas just on the, we were speaking before about uh, venison and whether or not South Africans will eat the different antelope. Biltong doesn't necessarily, now biltong for those of you who are unfamiliar with it is a South African snack that is made from dried and salted meat originally invented by the fur trekkers moving through South Africa. Obviously they didn't have refrigeration capacity and the salting and the drying of the meat allowed them to keep it for longer. It's the equivalent of beef jerky, but having tasted beef jerky, I have to be honest, it's um, not quite the same. And when I was a child, I grew up teething on biltong. Oh, waterbuck giving us a bit of a wink there. So biltong is not, it can be made from venison, from antelope. It can also be made from beef. They've invented chicken biltong, which I can't say is particularly Oh, there's two. Hello, waterbuck bull. Didn't. What was that? Like hmm? I it was Impala. I think it was Impala. I'm just going to listen for that sound again. Because to me. Or maybe it was Impala got my earpiece in so I can't hear exactly but that almost sounded like a distress call <coughs> but it hasn't been repeated so it's stopped now maybe it was Impala I'm gonna do a circuit of the area regardless just to see whether or not I can pick up on what that sound was but yes there's lots of different types of biltong anything from beef to venison and it is a very traditional South African snack Two magnificent waterbuck bulls. Might just be a herd of buffalo moving through. Just caught the end part of that sound. I think I'm actually going to turn around. I know we're all the way at the fire break. But I think I'm going to turn around and just go back towards the dam and investigate and see what caused that mystery sound. It was a sort of a sound. Kind of like a buffalo. All right, I'm going to go and investigate our sound. I'm going to try and find a safe place or good place to sit and listen. In the meantime, I have completely run out of ideas for these links, and I thought I'd give Steph a little bit of break from them. <laughs> so over to Steph. Let's find out how his lions are doing.
Well, thank you very much for that, Jamie. I knew it would end at some point, but I was liking the compliments anyway. We've just literally been hanging out to these lions. It's very rare that we get a chance to just sit in the bush, dead quiet, no other vehicles around us, alone with a mating pair of lion right here. And we're getting up to the point where they need to mate again. While you were away, they did mate one more time. It's why we've slightly repositioned where we are. We now are no more than five feet, or five yards, excuse me, from this particular pair. Still not seeming to pay us the least amount of notice. Just relaxing. I don't notice them shivering. I feel like shivering at the moment because we're not driving and keeping busy. I must be honest. I, a chill has set in me. <laughs> and I can't wait to get home and cup a cup of coffee in my lap and around my hands. The bird life around us at the moment, there's been a bird party that's come into this area of, uh, and moved into this area with these lions. And we've got a black-headed oriole, southern black tits. We've had a group of arrowmark babblers, a hoopoe. What else have we had, Ghat, that you saw? A white helmet shrike. We have had a black-breasted snake eagle and a batelier all flying around us in the last couple of minutes. It's been spectacular to watch. I've had my nose in a book, and I must be honest, there are very, very, very few things on this earth that give me greater pleasure than being in the presence of one of the large animals in Africa, alone and untroubled, with a box full of books, a friend, and the ability to teach people something new about the butch. It was a very nice day. One of those days to remember and of course the fact that it's overcast means that the sun isn't beating upon my bald head turning me into something like a circus animal <laughs> of some sort very special taking into context this female Kat and I were just busy having a chat about this female. He was privy to the first matings a couple, of, a couple of days ago, and he can absolutely confirm that this is the female that was mating five days ago, but not the same male. That male had a split in his lip. We, for a period, w were debating whether or not this was even the same couple, whether maybe in the days, the subsequent days, that perhaps it was a different male and female, and that perhaps... They've moved on and a new couple have started. But he seems to be pretty convinced that it's the same female with a different male, which is rare. Not uncommon, but rare. I've got a chin spot batis. Sally in Oregon has just asked if she, have cha if she has changed males, could she have snuck off to her cubs? Quite possibly, Sally. Um, you know, one thing that I have realized in all the years here is that while we think we know what these animals get up to, we absolutely have no idea. And even though we spend hours a day, I mean, we've literally been with these, these lions now for an hour and a half, maybe even longer than that. There's still 22 and a half hours left in this day, and who knows what they get up to in those days. I do have experience with lioness and cubs, and they move often. Quite often, you find them in exactly the same place in the afternoon, but they've walked to dens and back, they've walked to water and back. You find them walking all over the place. So, quite possibly, Sally, you know, just because we see them lying down doing nothing, mating every 10 minutes with one another and carrying on sleeping doesn't necessarily mean that this is what they do um, the whole day. And in particular when lions are most active, which is at night time, we are safely ensconced in our camps and have absolutely no idea what these cats get up to. Literally from 6 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning, we rely on tracks and tracking, and I must say, we're not the world's best trackers, and so unless it's absolutely fresh, a track that's a couple of hours old, we don't know where it goes and what it gets up to. So Sally, I'd like to believe that she is visiting her cubs. Um, it's equally a possibility that 
her cubs are dead already or have died. Um, just the fact that only two out of every ten cubs that get born reach maturity is enough to tell me that the odds are stacked quite heavily against them, unfortunately, in their first couple of weeks of life. But the fact that she's mating with this male, whether or not she's got cubs, is, is a good sign. There's, there's a stable pride structure at the moment. These Birmingham boys are young, they're strong. They are set to be here for hopefully many years to come. And even though she may have lost one litter, she's bound to have many more litters from now. I know that sounds a bit hard, but it is, it is a, a, you know, the chances are good that she'll have more babies, I think is what I'm trying to get at, rather than say she needs to just get over it. I don't think that that is easy for anyone. Rob and Ferreira, all the way from New Zealand, good morning. Well, it's good evening to you by now, probably already. And uh, I hope the day that we have yet to go into shows some promise. Um, you've just asked me um, how many, what's the ratio, what's the percentage of successful copulations for every cub that gets born? I only know of one statistic here, Rob, and that is um, that it's on average, and this is, av this is averaged across probably a continent rather than in a game reserve or a specific population of lion that for every cub that reaches one year of age 1000 copulations will have to take place so every cub that reaches one year of age 1000 matings will take place i personally probably think that that's a bit high um, you see them mating let's say over a five day period let me see over a 24 hour period and this is Take, just taking into account what I've seen, the first day, um, the first three days will be quite hectic. Um, if the female is in just a normal Easter cycle, that's a dominant male in the area, she doesn't have to shop around for other males, etc., etc. The first three days are quite hectic, um, with a mating taking place at first every five minutes and then decreasing to every three minutes about. That lasts for about 24 hours, and then it moves off into a sort of five to ten minute gap for 24 hours and then I'll move from a 10 to a 15 and then to a 20 minute gap for around about 48 hours tailing off to about one mating every half an hour to one mating every 40 minutes or so for day five or day six somewhere around there um, so you can work that out I'm sure quite easily much easily than me sitting here uh, without a calculator at hand um, and you'll see that there will be a certain amount of matings if she falls pregnant at this first copulation um, attempt over these couple of days. She will have between one and four, two and four babies. That's the, that's the most common thing here. So, you know, divide that amount of matings by, you know, four if you want the outside number. And that should give you amount of copulations per per baby. That should be able to allow you to do an amount of copulations per baby. Then factor in the fact that uh, on average, not here in the Sabi Sands, more cubs survive in the Sabi Sands than in other places. But let's say that 50% of the cubs that are born die before they're first year old. And that'll give you an, 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 another idea about how many matings are there in this particular area with these lions um, per baby that reaches a year. It should be somewhere quite high I I'm presume I'm gathering just trying to do the maths quickly in my head I'm thinking that it's probably somewhere in the hundreds of attempts of matings for each baby that's born that reaches a year of age and they'll have babies if they have babies um, if they if they if they successfully rear babies they'll have cubs every two and a half years and if the males are lucky they will sire up to three generations with the same female if they are lucky up to three generations with the same female generally though they hold on to territories for between three two and three years across Africa coalitions in the Sabi Sands and this part of the Kruger National Park can hold their territories 
a little bit longer than that, sometimes up to five years, but not much longer than that. Right, Jamie's got a bit of an update for you on whatever she's been keeping herself busy with in the last couple of minutes. As soon as they start mating again, I'll try and shout you back. <laughs> I've been desperately trying to keep myself and Dave busy. There hasn't been a repeat of that sound from the middle of the bush. I don't know what that was, but we'll have to leave it as one of those unsolved mysteries for now. I've just been keeping myself busy driving around to check Gallego Pan and then hoping that my luck shall change in the future. For this morning has not what been what I would call a hugely successful drive. I still had fun though. It's still wonderful just driving around, soaking in the atmosphere of the African bush and eagerly anticipating the leopard that will be around the next corner. It was hopeful. It was hopeful. There isn't a leopard around the next corner, but there might have been. There definitely might have been. Let's just go and check Gallego Pan ever so quickly. One of the few pumped water holes in this area, and therefore one of the few remaining water holes for the animals to come and drink. Hoping perhaps Mbula is just stretched out in his cat-like way across a termite mound. But I fear, no such luck. <laughs> All is quiet. Okay, well on that note, a big thank you to Dave for braving the dangers of the job and moving the monkey thorn as well as of course his fantastic camera work as always. Thank you to Rebecca and to Lou in final control and a big thank you to Steph for putting up with my absurdities. And most importantly, a big thank you to all of you watching across the globe. Join us in a few short hours for the Sunset Safari. In the meantime, I'm going to send you a farewell and send you back across to the amazing Stefan Winterboer. Bye-bye, everybody. I would gladly put up with Jamie's absurdities into eternity. She's a fantastic person to be around and I, I'm, I'm privileged to be part of the team that she's in. So thank you very much, Jamie. It wasn't bad at all today. You're welcome. Um, these lions haven't done much since you've left. We have got an impala that has walked into the monkey orange thicket that is behind these, uh, these lions. They haven't paid the sound the least bit of attention. I don't quite know. These impala around here for mating lions in the daytime, I think that impala's got a good chance of being able to dance a jig on the sand in front of these lions and escape unscathed. But let's hope in the next three minutes or so before we close that you get to see a mating event one last time. As mentioned already a couple of times, it is actually a, a special time. So James Richard has just asked a question, would a male with or who's dominant have, lower, have a lower testosterone level than a male who isn't? Absolutely, James. Um, male lions that have a territory and are in charge of a pride and are dominant definitely have higher levels of testosterone in their blood system than male lions who do not. Um, that I've heard from a couple of sources in the Kruger National Park already. Um, and so I tend to believe it. You can also see it. They tend to be bigger, they're more aggressive, they have more robust manes. Um, so yeah, I, I would absolutely support that, that James. Um, without doubt, in actual fact. Now we've got two more minutes. I'm hoping that in the next 120 seconds you get to see them mate at least one more time. So with all my willpower I'm willing this female to stand up or this male to do something. They're now lying almost nose to nose. I think he's busy staring at her <laughs> lovingly. I can only imagine in my mind's eye that he's 
unblinking stare is boring into her forehead trying to make her understand his intentions but then that's just the way my mind is working at the moment <laughs> nothing else she of course blissfully unaware and ignorant to his advances all by design what I am going to do is I am going to say goodbye so long just in case I don't get to do it while they're busy mating so while they're still quiet I'm going to say goodbye and thank you for joining us on the safari I'm so glad after the drought that Jamie and I've had in terms of big cats that we finally managed to spend a significant amount of time with these big cats so from myself and Gert and thank you to all of you thank you to FC thank you to everybody we'll see you again this afternoon